AHRB on Thursday evening, April 6, 2023. We have a, a very robust agenda tonight, and we're, we're hopeful of moving through it appropriately, but quickly, and we're going to be trying to limit com conversation and comments to three minutes or, or something like that uh, as we go through. I move that we open the meeting. Your second? Aye. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. The first item on our agenda is Zero North Mountain Drive, approval for proposed plans to construct a new home and a vacant lot. Mr. Chairman, this is, enough. This is a public hearing, so you may want to just open, it. Yeah. open the hearing. Yeah. Yeah, this is a continuation of a public hearing, and I, no? It's a new it's a opening. It. Okay. Okay. I'm second. Moving. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> Good evening, Chairman Hunter and members of the Planning Board. My name is Kristen Wilson. I'm here along with Patty Steinschneider, representing the owner of Zero North Mountain Drive. We've been before you for several months now. We're happy to have the public hearing. Uh, Patty will be presenting... Um, uh, overview of the project, including some videos uh, that will give the board and the public a good uh, bird's eye perspective of what the development would look like. Um, we believe we have answered all of your technical engineering slash planning questions. We are here. We understand that we also need to go to the zoning board. But as you may recall, the zoning board has asked that the planning board act first. So without further ado. <coughs> And it's over to Patty. Patty Steinschneider, Gotham Design, representing the owner of the property. Um, when I did this today, it was less than 10 minutes. But it, a lot of images, and I'll go pretty quick because I know you've got a long agenda. Um, this right? So when we started this, it was coming before you because the zoning board had identified concerns. Um, that had to do specifically with the fact that this was an unusual site, steep slopes, lots of rock, concerns like that. And they didn't feel that they should be addressing the variance components of it until they had a good understanding of, that this was a doable project that this lot could be built on. So they sent it to you. You guys have uh, asked us to provide a lot of information, which we have. And I think we've addressed all of the concerns that have been asked. Doesn't mean that there aren't other things that you might want to deal with, but. Um, I think we've made really good progress. In the beginning, we started with six items, um, which I'm staying to, although I've combined some of them. And you've actually brought up an, ex an additional one to what the zoning board had identified. They were talking about um, stormwater drainage, rock removal, landscaping, things like that. You also got, were concerned, expressed a concern with contextual compatibility, how this fits in with the neighborhood, how it relates to other houses other lots. So we've taken a, way, a look at each of those. And what I've tried to do is make it quick by summarizing what a lot of the information that you've gotten, how it fits into those questions and how, how those questions have been answered and the information that you've been given. Um, stormwater management, um, Hudson Engineering is the engineering firm handling this. Um, they have designed a robust storage system which um, handles all of the water on site um, one of the concerns here was with the amount of rock, they were concerned that um, it w everyone was concerned that there wouldn't be an ability to handle that volume of water here and it would go off under neighbors' properties. They have confirmed with their test pits and their, their uh, calculations that they're able to accommodate the entire 100-year storm on site with no overflow. So I think that is good. One thing that they aren't, they're, they're coordinated with this, but they haven't actually um, done the idea and worked out with the landscaping architect is we're the whole area of the uh, terrace that's around the pool and the back of the house that's all permeable paving that has not been put into the calculations that Hudson Engineering has done so they're holding 100 year storm and in addition to that we've got a, uh, the ability to collect seven inches of rain that falls on that terrace which is a, you know it's maybe a third of the impervious service we also, understanding the way this hillside works right now, 
which is relatively steep hillside coming straight down onto the street. There's a substantial amount of water that runs down that hillside now going to the street, which could be affecting neighboring properties. What we've proposed is having a swale at the bottom where we capture any water that does come down the shedding on the site. And we've got a drainage basin that's located in the northwest corner, which has the capacity to take that water and dissipate it with a level spreader so it's not a concentrated flow affecting neighbors, particularly the houses across the street. Um, what uh, Hudson Engineering did is they produced a stormwater management plan and drainage analysis. Uh, you've seen those before. You, they show where, you've, where they've excavated down and the perk test that they got. And then at the end of that, they provide a post-development condition summary, which I think one sentence is pretty much summarizes it. The system is designed to fully accept no release the entire stormwater runoff volume for the 100-year storm event from the watershed and exfiltrate the runoff into the surrounding soil. So it's a pretty definitive statement. It's not a portion of it. We're not delaying it. We're not detaining it to, to uh, discharge later. We're handling all of it. The next topic was the rock removal and site stability. Again, uh, Hudson Engineering did the work that they needed to do for the erosion and sediment control plans. Uh, how water will be handled on site during construction, all of those things have been addressed. Um, we also have gotten into it with uh, having prepared a excavation mechanical rock removal mitigation plan um, that was submitted to the board. You guys had the chance to look at that. There were some concerns that I had prepared that, so we gave that to our structural engineer. He took it and analyzed everything, and he gave you a certification that he was concurrent with all of the information that we had provided. He thought it was all worked out well. Um, the landscaping is Susan Janchill is the landscape architect. Um, she is, uh, the word robust fits into this a lot. Um, and her landscaping plan is very extensive with the right kinds of material to stabilize the site, provides greening, uh, foliage that'll absorb water, do all the things that we needed to do. Um, and that's been integrated into the entire design. So it's not something where somebody came and said, I'm going to do some flowers. I think they've uh, worked it up very well. Um, another concern was the vehicular safety. Uh, people have pointed out that North Mountain Drive is a relatively windy, steeply sloped road. There's not much we can do about that. We're talking about being one house on this. We're not talking about a large development that's going to bring a volume of traffic. The concern we narrowed it down to really was, could we get on and off the road safely with the driveway? Visibility, the ability to see uh, up and down the street, um, what steepness the driveway would have, um, all of that's been worked out. Your engineers um, have reviewed it. I believe that they're satisfied with everything except the letter that we're still looking for, although I know it's been written because it's been read to me from the fire department basically confirming that the paving of the driveway and the way this is set up works well for them, although they did point out that they don't pull their apparatus into driveways like that. So they would, if, any, if there was a fire at the site, they would be fighting it from the street. The main concern they had is how far is it from the house to the street? And the fact that it's 35 feet made them comfortable that that would not be an issue. Um, we did take photographs, measured down, up and down the street. We have 180 feet of clear visibility in both directions. That would be something that would easily handle a 45 mile an hour speed limit. And of course, the speed limit on this road, I believe, is 25 miles an hour. So somebody going almost twice that is driving dangerously. Um, but even then, you'd be able to see them coming. So I think that's good. Again, Cyrus Mandwobi, the uh, engineer working with us on the project, reviewed that and found it um, to be acceptable. Um, size of the house and context compatibility. Um, we provided two memos on that. One deals with the coverage calculations, how the village is looking at it right now, how we see it differently. Part of our experience, the way we're seeing it differently, has been, been doing work in the village for a very long time. We've, got, we've done more than 30 projects where we were using gross site area for both, uh, both calculations. We're being told at this point that the way it's supposed to be done is net. We've made an, app, an application for a revision to the zoning board, so we're asking for a variance for that. We're going to you know, try and get the variance on it. The other is uh, the context limit area. Um, as you guys probably know, is the village defines a context area as a distance up and down the same street you're on. We went beyond that. 
We looked at all the houses that were contiguous and the houses you could see, even if they were further away, but what gave us the context area. We then evaluated that, and we found that we're pretty much in the middle of the different things. We're, um, there are four lots in the 11 that are smaller than ours. There are six houses in the 11 that are bigger than what we're proposing. Um, it's an unusual situation. You've got a lot of houses with substantial property. You've got other houses with minimal property. The way the feeling works up there is it still feels very open, almost rural to an extent. It certainly doesn't feel like um, the more dense populated areas of Dobbs Ferry, Maple Street, or even Belden, those streets. It's, it feels very open and country. And the houses are very large, and they take great advantage of their site, as we're trying to do as well. Um, we basically came to a summary on what this is, which I just said, you know, how we fit in with houses being bigger, lots being smaller. So we feel that we're in the mix on it, but those are words we went out, we took photographs of the houses. And this is the house that's effectively across the street. It's a little bit south of the site, but there are a lot of cues in this house that we used when we took a look at what we were trying to do. Um, as we go to the next house down, again, very linear house facing the street. These two houses are built on a cliff um, right on the other side of the street. They actually have a driveway that's down a little bit, very nicely sited. It's, you know, it's quite cool. Um, but it's, again, it's a situation where people have made use of a, of a site in a very appropriate way, even though it's kind of a little bit different than what you'd think of as a suburban house. They feel more country house, and I think that's great. Um, there are some houses in the neighborhood that are very dramatic and quite amazing, actually. Um, this house alone, from this view, would be sufficient to be a very large house. And of course, here's the other side as it turns the corner. It's probably one of the nicest houses in Dobbs Ferry. Um, this is the house, actually, that's next up. This is 79. Um, again, a big house. This is a house that originally was the property that owned the property that we're looking to build on. This, this lot was subdivided off from that property. <coughs> Um, other houses have been built in the last 20 years up in the area. Again, large houses, three-car garage. At this point, I've come back down uh, the street and up down uh, North Mountain, and I'm on uh, Osceola. And you see the houses along Osceola are large, very nicely designed houses that are sitting well in the context of this neighborhood. Um, I just threw this in because it's one of my favorites. It's actually not on the street, but you see it from there. This is the house that Jonathan Foster did. I, we got to work with him on it. And she's, um, it's pretty interesting. It's, oh, it's like huge. But it works out nicely. It looks good. So now moving from photographs to the renderings that we've prepared, and Stuart is here from my office. He'll um, show you a video that shows this better. Um, but I figured just to set the kind of the character of how we fit in, um, it's kind of in what we believe is the same way those other houses have been done. Um, the house sits up, it sits back from the street, um, it nestles in, obviously it has to, it doesn't have a choice given the site, there's no flat area where we could go and build on, but we've tried to make good use of the site and find a way to make everything fit in. After this, we're just looking at the architectural drawings we've uh, submitted. The only reason I included this sheet, which is otherwise a really boring one, is we've proposed using the rock removal code from Irvington for this project, we've just taken it for, you know, verbatim from Irvington. Irvington has a very, again, robust uh, requirement for how rock removal is done. It limits time. It limits how many days. It gives all kinds of uh, restrictions on it. It mandates that you have a watering device so you're not creating dust. So we've included that in the drawings that we're submitting, which makes it a, a part of any approval that we would get and becomes a mandate of how we would have to do it. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that you need. Obviously, you've seen this stuff before. I mean, this one I think is important because this shows the 40% slopes, which in Dobbs Ferry is actually in the code for the purposes of where we're really concerned with building. It's on, on slopes that are exceeding 40%. Um, and we've done a pretty good job of fitting in um, into how all of that works. Um, I don't think we need to spend time on this because I know your agenda is long. This plan is you know, also showing our goal is hopefully to have fewer retaining walls than we're showing the plans. We can't guarantee that we're not going to need to build them, but um, our hope is that we'll be able to expose rock and have that be a feature of the site. This uh, slide just shows that we're, we are doing a cut and fill, trying to fit in um, how we work with the site so that the, um, the way we change the site from being a continuous slope to one that gives us a building site 
Um, a lot of thought went into how to make that work. Um, here's showing this, uh, the uh, sky exposure plane. Again, you're seeing that this house is not like close to a property line. It's not looming over somebody's house. And of course, the properties that are adjacent to this are unbuilt on. So I don't know that we're really at risk of having an adverse impact that way. Um, this shows the first floor, um, kind of pretty standard in the world of today's nicer houses. This shows the second floor with the three bedrooms, the three bathrooms, um, elevations on the house. We're looking for it to be brick and stucco with some panels of wood. Um, we think that'll be a good aesthetic for this. And I don't know if you guys are ready, I'm guessing you're not, to go into your role as the AHRB, but we have been providing the materials, the details, you know, colors and all of that stuff. So. It's really, if you guys feel it's time for that, we'll do it. If not, we can wait to the next step. But this kind of goes into all that, and I think that is it. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, actually, I, Stuart has to be allowed to. He worked so hard on these things. I don't want him to not get a chance to do them. So you're going to figure out how to make this work, right? Okay, they're right down there. So I'll be showing two videos here. While he's doing that, I have a question. Um, so you're applying, you requested from the ZBA um, for them for a variance or for them to actually look at the well the uh, gross versus net yeah the, the attorney is sitting behind me and she's much more aggressive than I am so <laughs> um I yeah I'm sure so you might if you're, you're going to speak sorry to interrupt your presentation you could you could talk about it later if you want I mean, maybe yeah the, yeah do it after that Sorry. So this is a, like a drone shot around the house. You don't know who the guy is. <laughs> it's a bit laggy, but the internet connection. The, the uh, foliage, the trees, the planting, it is compliant with the uh, landscaping plan that we provided. This is the actual material. Yeah, it would be helpful to see it in the context of the area there. <clears throat> we changed the color of the area around it so this is the color. <laughs> this is like eye level is probably down. What it is that's helpful. I was just going to share the okay, you done. Thank you. Procedurally, we're in front of the zoning board um, with two 
dual requests. The initial request at the zoning uh, to the ZBA was, the initial question was whether this had a, <clears throat> was a building lot. And at that point, the zoning board said, they kind of kicked it back to you and said, let's see if they can cite a house here before we have to even address this question. So we, that is pending. That was, it's a joint uh, appeal. It's appealing the building inspector's determination that it was not a building lot. However, if the zoning board was willing to grant a variance, we'd be just as satisfied with the variance itself. Similarly, a couple months ago, maybe two months ago, there was a question about lot coverage, whether you use the gross or net area. We had one opinion, the village has another. So we were appealing that determination as well. However, in the alternative, if the zoning board would be willing to grant us the variance, we'll certainly take that, that variance. So we've preserved both options. Thanks. Thank you. It's a public hearing, shall we? Yeah, it is a public hearing. I'd like to move that we open the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Is there anyone from, from the public that wishes to speak to this application? Anybody online? Yes. yes, we received three letters, two in support of the project and one Questions. questioning <laughs> it. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I am uh, Jim Anacarico with Cronin Engineering. Uh, I was uh, retained by uh, one of the neighbors, uh, at the Valvanos at 8 Osceola, just kind of follow along. Uh, and I've been, you know, following the uh, application since its uh, initial uh, submission. And you know, I've been pretty happy with uh, everything that the board and the town consultants and actually the, uh, the uh, applicants uh, professionals um, have submitted up to, to this point. Um, Main focus was just making sure that there was no negative impacts to the neighbors, uh, you know, down slope of the site. Um, as Patty uh, mentioned, and I've worked with Pat uh, on many project projects over the years. Um, you know, uh, we're happy with uh, what they've shown. Uh, there's one thing that we'd like to point out, um, which is on the west side of North Mountain Drive directly across from the uh, proposed driveway where the, where the trench drain is, uh, there, there is a portion of curb that's missing there. Uh, it's just either, you know, got removed by snow plows over the years or it's just never there. Um, and since the road is pitched, we just want to make sure that in a storm event greater than the 100-year storm or if the system clogs for some reason, um, that, that trench drain will essentially be the, uh, overflow. And we just want to make sure that there's a potential for somebody, whether it be the village or, or the, or the applicant, uh, during construction to establish a, a curb on that side of the road. Uh, cause in the current condition, cheap flow goes off the pavement down slope, uh, through one property and eventually ends up in the backyard of the Valvanos. No. So we were just hoping that, uh, you know, you could take that into consideration and uh, possibly make that some sort of condition of the approval. Right. You sent in a late email Correct. this afternoon. We, uh, yep. I didn't get it in, uh, just mainly because I didn't know there was a deadline. <laughs> so apologize for that. But, uh, you know, we can uh, submit that letter next week. I don't know if it matters at that point, but. Uh, we would like the, the record, uh, the letter, you know, to be part of the record. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What is the nature of the curb there? Is it like just an ass turned up asphalt thing, or is it actually a stone curb? No, it's there are sections that are Belgian block, but most of it is uh, plowable asphalt, which basically means that when you plow it, a lot of the asphalt disappears. Yeah. Um, I think you know 
at least on our side of the street, we've talked about putting in the you know cobblestones because that's what would give give us the ability to create the kind of swale we really want to have. Um, I certainly am able to go back and talk to the client who I think would be very interested in both sides of the street in front of their house looking good. It's a village street. The village yeah. might be interested in doing it too. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I've been watching the budget. I don't <laughs> think so. I think um, the village would probably be very happy if we took the responsibility of putting that in. Yeah. Although you'll be in the villages right away. I mean, you'll have to get, I don't know, how, have you'll, to get I don't know how you'll do it. Yeah, you'll have to get permission <laughs> from them too. Okay. I mean, we could treat it like a disturbed condition and the kind of re reclamation that we have to do you know, before we're allowed to get the lot closed off. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate that, Patty. Good. Other comments? Thank you. Other comments from uh, the people here or online or on the board? <laughs> yeah, I have some questions. Um, so I was looking for the ZBA letter referral to us today and I couldn't find it, but I have a question. So is the question, can you build something on this site as opposed to the other, you know, another side of the coin would, would we recommend this particular project? So, you know, for me, I, I'm not so adverse to uh, saying, listen, the, this lot is a little small, but you could build something on this. The, the, the uh, proposal shows you could have proper drainage. You can build on the steep slopes. Your driveway isn't going to be so steep, you know, too steep. All these things that make a functioning project. For me, the idea of approving a project that has a 44% overage in the uh, building coverage is seems like incredibly bad precedent, and I can't imagine approving a project like that. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I was looking at this very helpful chart that you gave us. Thank you very much. And, uh, it is one of the larger houses. Um, and I, I was just looking at two Osceola, which we're gonna look at tonight, and that's, I mean, it's 18% coverage compared to your 16% uh, of your proposal. So it's a, this, this area is a mishmash, yeah. but I am concerned with the precedent. I mean, there are, we do have codes, and it'd be nice to try to stick to them, you know? So, mm -hmm. I mean, just make the building smaller. You know? Just make it smaller. I mean, Less coverage. I wouldn't have any objection to doing that, but I have to recognize that my client has specific interests. It's a three-bedroom, three-bathroom house. Um, it's got, you know, it's, the rooms are generous in, in standard, but not uniquely large. No, right? I actually had another idea. On either side of it are empty lots. You could just buy a little bit of one or a little bit of another one and <laughs> again get some more put some more land. You know? Yeah, I, I, I can suggest that. Um, the 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 you know that's always things like that are always great ways to try and figure it out. I don't think we can really mandate that. And I think if I'm understanding what Alan's saying, it's if you accept the interpretation that it's the percentage of the net, not the percentage of the gross. That's the current position of the village. We have to work within that yeah. position. Understood. That's one of the reasons we wanted the ZBA. But I'm not the only person who has built lots of buildings in the last, since 1989 in Dobbs Ferry, that used the gross, the last in 2022. So it's not something that was back then and different. In fact, the next project that was on the agenda after this lot was created in October 1989 was Livingston Ridge. And I was there representing that project. And when we went through that project, we, had, we were told that even though we had gotten approvals in 86, because we hadn't started construction, we now had to meet the steep slopes um, requirements for determining the number of units that we would be permitted to have. So we did the study. We understood the village put a lot of time and effort into coming up with those metrics. Um, and we said, we have to live with these metrics. We will accept the number that we're able to have once we come back. So we had previously proposed 22 units. We came back and changed our application to be 24 because that's what the metrics permitted. Um, when we did that, the coverage was the gross lot area, not the net. Patty, you're wasting so, yeah, time. Yeah, we can. You know, if you want to put the table this until no. The decision is made whether it's net or gross i think we're all happy to do that yeah so i think the zba is looking for direction from the planning board um because they if you recall 
they did refer it to this board. The board referred it back to the ZBA, and the ZBA said they want to actually have this board, you know, take it to the point of feeling comfortable with site plan approval and then refer it back to them. So the question I think at hand is, you know, what type, if, if this project is ready to go back to the ZBA or you're, you're comfortable recommending it back to the ZBA, if not, you know, maybe have the discussion of what you would like to see tweaked or changed prior to your recommendation to the ZBA, or you have the alternative of recommending one or both or neither of the variances to the ZBA. And the two specific variances are? The, um, the lot area as well as the building coverage. The lot area is, again, a miss of the, how much? Uh, I don't have. But yeah, you have that. It's a 21% under it. Yeah. It's the lot area. 21%. And the coverage, the coverage of the building or the impervious, impervious surface? The, it's the building coverage. And the, it's 9.46%. For building coverage over yes so it's yeah you have 16 percent now i i tend to agree with you i mean how about you lara i mean i i i feel that the lot area maybe is okay if we were to you know go back to the zoning and say you have to be it's a buildable lot and we could um we can live with that, but I think the building is way too big for that size of a lot. Only because um, it just it encroaches on the border of the whole the lot, and it's it doesn't seem proportional. Even though we have other houses in the area that are larger and within the same style, but their lots are also a lot bigger and can handle the ratio. So I would say. Um, I could go with the lot area approval, but not the building lot. Not the coverage. Not the coverage. Yeah. I'm, I think it's a buildable lot, yes. Yeah, I mean, you proved that you could do it. It's just, it's all building and coverage, basically. Yeah. There's very little parkland around it. Yeah. I'm concerned, yeah. yeah. It's a big, it's a big, uh, big house. It's in that small space. And that's always been my feeling about that. Mr. Chairman. Well, I guess I'm not quite as concerned about that, but I, I, I don't, on the other hand, I don't like to have precedence. So, so where do we I go? think, I think in this, in this, this case, in that location, it, it's, it's an unusual location and you, you can, I think, absorb a little bit of different differential. It is well tucked into the hillside yeah. yes so but, it, but it's depressing. i don't i don't think it's an issue in this location but it, it may be a bad look precedent precedent but i probably in the end would end up voting yes but uh -huh. <laughs> yeah i mean i i it is the, the i guess the precedent issue that concerns me because if you if i didn't know all the numbers right if we weren't thinking about how much it's over and various things. I think it works. I actually think it could, it doesn't look overwhelming to me in this neighborhood. But it is true that those are, it's, it's a, we, the only way, I mean, if there were, if we could really come up with enough reasons why somehow those exceptions were worth granting here then I could see voting for it, but I guess it is the scale of the precedent that we've been setting, I guess, is a little bit. Well, also, I feel there. like um, variances and waivers should be in the village's interest. You know, if it's six inches, it's fine and it makes your project work. But a big variance like this, if you had affordable housing units, if you were close to mass transit, if you were, you know, something, something that brings to the village some value, mm -hmm. then a waiver or variance makes sense to me, but but a single family dwelling far away from mass transit doesn't meet with no affordable housing component does not meet those criteria in my mind. Yeah. You can play golf. <laughs> Free golf course. No, I don't think so. 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 <laughs> so if you took away the number, 
the, the size of the variance, because that seems to be what some of you are focusing on, and leave that to the zoning board and their balancing test. That's their expertise. That's their jurisdiction. I mean, we do meet the setback requirements. We are able to fit a house that is, of course, under our interpretation, zoning compliant, but it does fit contextually based on the aerials. I think that was a great showing of what the neighborhood is like, what other size houses are there, that given the site constraints here, it is tucked into the site. But if you took away that number, if that number wasn't X and it was X minus 20 or whatever, I don't want, I don't want that to be a misnomer. If you took our interpretation of the code, we would comply. We wouldn't need any variances. So, and that's why we're preserving both arguments kind of at the zoning board. But the zoning board came, you know, said, look it, if you can figure out the site dynamics and the character of the neighborhood and it can work, then they'll, they're they willing to look at the balancing test and, and weigh the substantiality of the variance against the neighborhood, the environmental impacts. Overall, to your point, Mr. Hale, I, I do think there's an environmental benefit to the village to the neighbors in that area. It's not affordable housing. This is a single family home district. You know, we're not near mass transit, so we have to use the, the property in the best way we can, but there are environmental benefits to the neighboring homes based on this development. We're making it better there for stormwater runoff. We're, we'll do curbing work. We'll work with the landscape. It looked pretty good to me, but you know, we're, we're here to make it work. That's what we're, we're why, the um, property owner hasn't retained so many professionals to make this work for the village and provide a benefit. So I don't, I guess I implore this board to see if there is a site plan that works, putting aside the percentage of variances, which may or may not be accurate. That's pending before the zoning board. And they, they have the jurisdiction to weigh those five area variance factors. Well, it's not really pending before the zoning board, I think, right? Oh, we... That determination of how that, the net versus gross thing is interpreted won't be up to the zoning board either. That's up, right? That's a position that the, that no. the village... We've appealed the... So the determination was made by the building inspector, as, and then we have appealed that. So that appeal is pending, but as I... Appealed tried, it to... Zoning, the zoning board. They're asking the zoning board to make an interpretation of, as to whether the uh, building inspector's determination was correct or not. And has the zoning board indicated a willingness to do that, to make that determination? That interpretation? Yeah, I mean, I think you've, have you submitted that application yet? We have. Yeah, I mean, so I think it's on their agenda yeah. next week. Right, it's on the, for the 12th, both. So, but as I mentioned, if the zoning board was, you know, because they, for a variety of reasons, may not want to overturn the building inspector's decision. If they're willing to grant the variance, it, it's six of one half dozen of another to, to the applicant, to our, to our client. Either the variance is granted or if our interpretation is correct, then the building inspector would be, would be overturned. So- I, I guess the, the, to, to Laura's point, you know, if we were to, to grant or support the variance from the zoning board on the lot area. You could still, it's, it's not like you couldn't build a really big house in this property, right? Like we're not talking about, we're not talking about the, you being up against some constraint that makes it impossible to build a pretty big house on this property, right? So th that's why that there won't be a hardship. You won't be able to make a hardship argument like, because it's not like you're up against something that's preventing you from the productive use of this property. You can build a really big house that's a whole lot closer to the coverage requirements than is being proposed, right? right. But it might not be a house that fits properly with that character neighborhood. Well, no, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's, oh, I there's no adjustment being made for increasing the percentage as the lot size decreases. One of the things that I know the land use uh, committee worked on hard was trying to find those balances. So if we are in a zoning district that allows 18% coverage, 
and requires a minimum of 20,000 square feet. And we're being told because of steep slopes deduction, not because the lot isn't 23,337 square feet, but we have to reduce the number we're basing that on to 15,750. We're then building a house that's 18% of 15,750. That is, if we were in a 15,000 square foot zoning district, we would be permitted to have 22%. So it's kind of a weird, it, it's one of the reasons I don't agree with this interpretation, because I happen to unfortunately be saddled with the reality of knowing why they had that law. And I know that we've been building for 30 years, whatever it is, with that law in place for the gross lot area. When you talk about precedent, I'm kind of perplexed that the the other people who have designed houses in this community also using the gross lot area all of this time, how that is not somewhat of a precedent. Well, looking at your site plan, uh, it really looks like um, a lot is pretty much filled up with structure and paving and so on. But And keep in mind that the lots on either side are empty. So it looks like you have tons of space, but when a house goes up in that lot, another one goes up in the lot on the other side. It would be similar to the two houses across the street. Yeah, I'd like to touch on Rob's component too. So I just ran the numbers, and you can have two floors that are over 2,800 square feet. So 5,400 square feet would be compliant. How big a house does it need to be? We're not, we're not, we're less than. Well, are you building two floor? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, Check my numbers. We got the, the, the family room is two story. Family room. Is I see. So that's why you're losing. And we, we have a three car garage. Okay. I mean, if you eliminated the garage and we just left all the cars outside, you would be fine. But that wouldn't be in, in their interest, and I certainly don't think that would be the interest. No. I don't know. I think you could build a big house and be compliant. So how do we move this I don't forward? Know. That's that's because we have a lot dilemma. on our agenda. I'm, I think I'm probably more positive than some of my board members. Uh, we need to respond to the ZBA, right? Correct. Uh, yes. Okay. And then you still are in a public hearing. I don't know if the yeah we have a public hearing, but I'm right. I think the public hearing will be adjourned, you know, until the ZBA makes their determination. Um, but the, for a resolution, recommendation resolution is what the ZBA is looking for from the board tonight. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I'll make another call for anybody that wants to speak <laughs> on this from the public. I think, I mean, at this point, the board might want to consider just having individual, I mean, you're welcome to vote any way you'd like, but maybe look at each variance and then maybe vote on each variance and then you can provide me some additional you know, uh, criteria or um, recommend, you know, information that you'd like me to include in the resolution to pass on to the ZBA for their consideration. Yeah. Okay. That sounds positive. So the first, um, the first one that we would be uh, submitting a resolution is the building lot coverage, correct? Or is it a, is it a feasible so the building lot? to build on is right that? so why don't we why don't you start with the the first one which is actually the um lot area which they're seeking a variance for okay should we make it a motion or just sure yeah. okay yeah yeah okay i make a motion that we approve the uh building lot coverage so why don't we recommend a recommend, recommend. recommend. <laughs> this is really recommend. right this is well, really we, more of a, a lot of recommendations right. recommendation right. yeah no, that's good all in favor. Is there a second? Here. All in favor on the board? Aye. Good. And then the second issue. The second or... is for the building coverage area. I don't think the board is prepared to. That well, we could vote on it. Scale. Well, should we, we, make, the, we can make a motion and then vote for or against? Well, I mean, you can you can do a couple of different things. If you want the resolution just to reflect that there's a split decision, and maybe, you know, I think that could be fine as well. And. Dan, you're shaking we should head, probably right? vote on yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so there's a motion to recommend that the there uh, building lot coverage variance. variance. Okay. All, all in favor? Second. All in favor? All in, who's in favor of allowing that? The larger building. 
And against? Crickets. <laughs> um, Stephen, how would you like to vote? Who, me? I'm no, positive. I'm positive. positive. I'm positive. Okay. So there's, so it's. One in favor. Five to one. Okay. Would <laughs> you to, like, four to one. I mean, four to one, thank you. Um, would you like me to, uh, do you, would you like to note anything in the resolution as to reasons or precedent. anything to? I would say precedent. Yeah. That the scale of the variance seems excessive. <clears throat> and that it would still be possible to build a, huh? So it I being think that the board, I think the yes. board should have yes, this discussion. It being a, I'm not saying president. I'm just saying that the house is too big for the, the lot. Regardless of the, right. the numbers. Okay. Anything else? So I'll, so I will. We'll have the resolution. We'll specifically recommend that, you know, that the applicant should continue the proceedings before the Zoning Board of Appeals and that that the Planning Board uh, reviewed the proposed site plan and believes the, the site plan as proposed um, does, meet, um, does meet the intent of the uh, zoning and land use chapter uh, based upon the square footage of the lot area that you find that that particular building uh, meets the characteristics. I mean, excuse me, the lot area would meet the characteristics and uh, ha be able to have a house on the lot, but you have concerns with the building coverage, especially the scale of the variance as well as the overall massing of the house. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I just want to um, adjourn the public adjourn hearing. The public hearing to May fourth. Uh, okay. Adjourn the public hearing. All in favor? Second. Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank everyone in the audience for being, being, staying with us here on this. Next item on our agenda is 34 Clinton Avenue, public hearing for proposed renovation and addition to existing building to create multifamily residential building. Good evening. I'm Christina Griffin, uh, Good evening. principal of CGA Studio Architects, and I'm here with Suzanne Levine, project architect, Dipti Shaw, consulting architect, and Louis Fusco, and the, home, the owner developer, John Sarebo. Um, so we have been through a few meetings with you, and we have been developing the project to fine tune certain elements to be uh, in response to comments. Um, this is a view on the front page of our, um, of our proposed multifamily uh, development. Um, for those who weren't at the other meetings, we're planning to restore the outside of this old uh, Queen Anne house and where it, it has now three residential units in it. We're planning to add a fourth in the, in the lower level in the basement. And then we're going to add this addition to the right, which will add another um, 
another seven units, a total of 11. We've designed the building to be very much in character of the older buildings on the street, um, to have the scale and facade and the details of some of the older, um, like large homes on, in the area. Um, and I'm gonna take you through our latest drawings to show you some of these features. Let's start with the site plan. Okay. Well, we'll start with the zoning, I guess, just to let you know where we, where we landed up with the project. This lot is just under 30,000 square feet. Once we take our deductions for steep slopes, we're down to uh, 27,763. We are using the um, sliding scale, which requires that our building coverage is, instead of 30%, is 21, 20.1% and our impervious coverage instead of 60 is 40%. Our um, proposal is to have a building that will um, be at 23.9% um, building coverage, and we're requesting a waiver of 3.8%, which is primarily to take care of the um, underground garage, which is under the front uh, courtyard. Um, and that was really to eliminate as many um, on-site parking spaces as possible. Our impervious coverage ended up 32% less than the 40.2% required. Um, and the parking spaces, we know that 17 are provided, and I'm gonna just show you, we have now located 11 spaces in the garage and only four outside, with two for future parking spaces. So this is our latest site plan. We, we're, we're calling it Scheme B, just because we did a series of schemes, and we decided on this as the best scheme for the project, and that's because we have put most of the parking in, in, under, in a garage we have three spots that are underneath the courtyard. And even though with, without a garage there, we wouldn't include that as billing coverage when we put the garage there, even though it's underground and it's not visible, it now becomes part of the building coverage. Um, so this is our garage layout, and we have now uh, 11 spots inside, including handicap spot, and then we have uh, four outside with space for two future spots. We're um, following the recommendation of the Westchester County that said that perhaps instead of having the full 17 spots, we could have um, maybe leave a few for future in case we need them. Since we're so close to the downtown and there could be people with only one car. Um, I just wanted to show you the comparison of the existing site plan and proposed Again, mostly for the public. Right now there's a big turnaround and there's parking for about four cars on the site. That's, that's the plan on the left, that's existing. And Propose is on the right where we have four cars um, on the site, open parking spaces and the rest of the parking inside the building. Next slide. This is just a, a blow up of our garage um, layout. Um, just quickly to review the layout of the, of the units. There are two bedroom, two bath units. One is affordable, which is in the old building on the basement level. Um, these have been designed to follow universal principles, universal design principles, which means that there's a elevator access to all the units, all the, the hallway leading to the units, giving, making every, and every unit is handicap adaptable, which means it could be handicap accessible. They vary from um, just under 1,000 square feet to 1,500 square feet. So the idea is this, these units are, um, could be for aging in place, allows for 
you know, handicap accessibility and also for families with, you know, children. Um, next slide. And also want to point out that if you look at the shape of the units, we are really trying to follow a kind of the design of the building is a variation on a theme, the theme being the Queen Anne old house with the angular bays and the um, dormers up at the attic and gables. And we even have a tower element, which is a very popular feature on Clinton Avenue right now. Um, I, I um, want to go back. Could we go back to the site plan? Because I just want to point out something else. Uh, another thing that was uh, very important to the design of the building is to have a really large front yard. The minimum front yard requirement is 40 feet. We have 80.9 feet. And we did this because I felt that that is something that's very special about Clinton Avenue, these big front yards, all this open space. And we have decided to keep the paving and the parking to one side, and on the other side, we have an open lawn area. And it actually is a great benefit to the residents because now there's a place for, there's a level area where kids could play um, instead of just having to go down to the steep, down the steep slopes to the um, yard in the back. I think we'll just go through the plans. I guess the attic plan third floor and is just showing that much of the third floor has knee walls and dormers because it really is mimicking the way third floors were handled in very old houses um, and this also helps to reduce the bulk of the house of the building next slide this is our roof plan just showing all the dormers and the gables and the tower feature in the corner Next slide. Then we were asked to show you a aerial view of before and after. Um, this is an aerial view that shows, uh, I don't know if you can all see where the house is now. Yes. This is, that's where the original house is and remaining. And we're gonna show you the next slide. Okay, this slide shows the addition, um, which will have um, seven units in it attach to the uh, Queen Anne house. Um, and you can see there's a range of sizes of buildings in this neighborhood. They, um, some similar in size. And then the idea was though to try to keep that link, the, the link that has the elevator and egress stair pushed back about 35 feet from the facade so that you would really feel a sense of two big um, houses uh, from the street when you're looking at the building from the street. Next slide, please. This is our front elevation. Um, the new facade is in line with the existing wall of the old house. And what we've done is we've designed this so it has an angular bay, similar um, gable, same roof slope, so that there is a, a, a connection with the old building, even though it's a really kind of a variation on the theme. The width of our main facade exactly is the same width of the old building, and the height is the same. But the materials and the treatment of the of the, of the facade is slightly different, like variations on the theme that we're working with. The entry, we've given it a more, a cleaner look. We have some, you know, modern details, but not too modern. We looked at all glass there and felt that we were introducing a third style. And um, we decided to go with a cleaner, just look, all the details are very clean with the windows are set into a stucco wall. And then we're going to have uh, shingles that are um, painted and all the gables and the dormers. We have a, a little break from the, um, the fiberglass roof with a standing seam roof and the standing seam dormer and above the front entry. Are there, are, are there any changes in this uh, presentation from what we saw last, yeah. last month? The link, 
in the middle. Centerpiece. The, the centerpiece. Joint, the joint between the two. Yes. And that's the key thing to focus on. Yes, we had done in in house several versions, and I know there was a um, an idea that of looking at making this very modern, just a total break, maybe all glass. And when we looked at that idea, we felt we were just like almost creating another style here. So we, we thought it would be nice if you walked up and you just have a, you know, a very, you know, the second floor is, and the first and second floor is floor to ceiling glass. So it's a nice break, but not uh, modern in a way that it's shouting out at you and it's all glass. Um, and the dormer is very simple without overhangs, not like the other dormers. We're gonna show you some inspiration photos just so that you can see what inspired us to come up with this design. Um, but before we get there, I'm gonna show you the other elevations, which I think we saw last time, maybe not with all the, sh all the texture. Um, we have a uh, shingle all the gables and dormers, all, and also the upper part of the tower. And then we have smooth stucco everywhere else uh, with a, a band that wraps around at the windowsill just to pick up on that idea which comes from the old Queen Anne house. And down below is just the shape of the facade to just give you the idea of the articulation that we gave the building so that it really has a lot of depth. And even on this side, this is facing north, we have a break between two pieces, almost like two houses with a recess between so that um, it breaks up the roof and the wall and helps with the massing. Next slide. And we have a, the 3D up on the right just for, you can see what that might look like. And this is the rear of the building. Again, we have a lot of breaks and uh, um, angular shapes and um, but done in a, a sort of a simplified way, very clean way. We're planning to inset all the, all the um, windows and have them have, you know, very thin, like a brick mold set into the stucco. It's just the view of the new next to the old. Um, so, you know, simplicity, clean look, we felt. And then this, this concept where the upper Items up, up in the roof line have more texture and we feel is like a reference to what's going on in the original house, which, the, which has brick below and the textured um, painted um, siding above. Well, actually, it's actually, uh, some of those gables are uh, slate. And this is just this, that's the original bay window that you'll see on the way into the building that we're going to restore. It's just really uh, has a lot of character, a lot of nice uh, detail. And this is our color and material scheme. And it's just showing that um, we wanted to, to pick a color, like an olive green for the shingles that'll be in the gables and on the dormers, and then down below kind of a um, driftwood gray or a topi gray, just a have a color that really fits nicely next to a building that has just a beautiful, you know, this is a 3D rendering, but the, we show you the photo, it's just beautiful brick facade with a lot of variety of details. Um, so rather than compete with it, we decided to go very simple, but um, similar themes. And then these are just our colors. We, these are our pavers. Um, which are very simple, rectangular, um, stone-looking pavers. We're planning to use a synthetic slate to replace this, the slate that is actually on the wall of the old house. We want it to match the materials, the original materials, as closely as we can to really um, bring that old building back to its former glory. Um, and then these are just different views down below showing the type of standing seam roof we want to do above the link and uh, fixtures that are more on a modern side for um, sconces and uh, path lights. Next uh, slide. And just to give you a little background on what inspired us to come up with these ideas for the addition, um, we are, you know, we looked at very clean looking stucco buildings with inset windows like the one on the two first images, which is the way we'd like to treat the windows in the, in the new 
um, building. And then to the right, you see uh, a, a Victorian with a um, tower idea, and it's just, it's just inspiring us to sh see how you can combine different materials. Same thing on the left. So we wanted to make sure the tower had a different material on the top level. And then for the link, we were looking at this really crisp idea of just even though it's not, you know, it is, when you get to that link and look up, it's very clean and simple and, and kind of quiet, as quiet as can be. We actually over, you, you saw different evolutions of the project and we really lowered that roof as low as we can. And then we're just gonna have a small dormer because we want that link to be quiet. And then this is, the, this is the, our first and favorite image because it really is, represents the concepts that are in the old house where you've got you know, uh, some texture um, up in the gable and uh, you know, bays, different shapes of bays and different shapes of windows and very whimsical, uh, which is actually, if you look at hard at the original Queen Anne building, it has those, uh, those kind of ideas. Um, so actually, um, I'd like to turn this over to the landscape architect, Louis Fusco, who is going to take you through the latest um, site plan and landscape drawings. Christine. Thank you. I know Christine touched upon it, so I'll, I'll try to be a little quick with the uh, site plan. Um, as you had mentioned, um, you were, this was actually closer to the Scheme 3C uh, that we had presented last time, we, that alternative. And um, basically, What's happening now is we have uh, four parking spaces out front. I've actually separated them with a planting strip in between so that we can even soften that even further. Uh, there's also a, um, a fence. Uh, we have a privacy fence still uh, that will be backing up on behind the, uh, the actual parking. And then when we look at the planting plan, we'll see the plantings also. The PAP system has now um, we went a little bit more residential for the path system and entry and a little less uh, you know, robust or modern that the earlier plans had. So we now have the serpentine path um, that goes in. We also tried to look at in the previous renditions, because of grading and all, I had to, uh, we had to have a number of steps coming up to the, the landing with the parking uh, uh, underground and the park, the main uh, focus of the, the entry area. So what we were trying to do, although the building is handicapped accessible because of the elevator going in, we were trying to also allow that if there were young families with strollers, that we now only have like one step in areas so that it's a lot easier to manipulate this path coming down um, is mostly is all level in this area. And, and we're creating a larger lawn space now, uh, an area that was previously or is existing right now as the driveway will now all be a, you know, a common lawn. Next slide. Okay, so on the right, uh, the, you'll see planting plan on the, on the left actually uh, is all, as I mentioned last time, we have uh, planted uh, totally native uh, plant material palette for our plantings. Um, some of the comments that came uh, were trying to open it up still so that it had more of a residential feel from the street. So we eliminated the majority of the evergreens. You'll see it when we review the, um, the 3D model photos, but we've eliminated most of the evergreens from the front. There's now just more uh, upper story deciduous trees. There's still enough screening of parking. We have evergreens that uh, and a nice evergreen breakage on both sides of the property for the uh, neighbors. Um, drainage, we've substantially improved uh, the drainage of the site. Uh, right now, as you've seen and we were out at the site, the problems behind the building, all, um, all of the uh, roof drains and roof keys have all been taken care of into uh, infiltrators that are in on the site. We've also doubly, uh, the driveway is now a, a pervious paver, so all of that, uh, uh, there is room below those pavers to accomplish that drainage, which we talked about at last meeting, but in addition, 
we're still, uh, we haven't eliminated that requirement, so there's sort of a second amount of it that if it ever overflows, it goes into the infiltrators. So we're almost doubling the amount of drainage in that sense. In addition, we've included the rain garden in the back to, not that we're at all required to take neighboring water that's coming down from the neighboring properties, but just as a, since we are planting that area, we're creating this uh, um, in the back far corner, the rain garden, which then goes into a dry stream bed that sort of wraps around our planting so that that overflow of that rain garden would then help mitigate and go into the plantings in the rear of the property. Thank you. This is just a uh, photo of the uh, privacy fence. It's actually a board on board with a little bit of light and air going through for plantings there. Continue from the planting. Thank you. So this is an overview, bird's eye view looking down in. You can see how um, we've, we've uh, actually lined the entry walk with uh, three um, uh, white birch, canoe birch, that are native birches, um, so it'll have a nice residential feel to it. Um, you can see uh, to the right with the parking, the heavy evergreen screening on the side, uh, plantings of shrubs and perennials and flowering plants, very residential style of planting scheme for this area, and um, the uh, decorative interlocking paver as well. Street view, um, the cars that are parked are parked underneath, you know, behind these evergreens here, so they're screened from the road. The up at the street level is the existing uh, hedge, which we supplemented wherever it is, you know, has, has uh, needs to be repaired in certain areas. And then we have a secondary layer behind that of some more deciduous shrubs and low uh, flowering evergreens in there to give some uh, winter interest at that point also. I didn't mention earlier, but I know Christine mentioned on the opposite side of the driveway where the walk is, is where we have the two extra parking spaces that if are to be needed in the future, they can be pulled out into that area. Thanks. A view from uh, the opposite corner looking back in from the street now, the house is much more prominent and you're seeing it more residential um, as, uh, you know, as it is in the area now. Again, a close-up as you're coming up the walk. The, the entry plaza has changed a little bit because of I can't do as many plantings as we had earlier because of the garage underneath. So we have planters and uh, paving plantings and benches along that entry area view from the uh, parking up into the area. So as we start going around the building, side view of the building, again supplemented with uh, evergreen, a uh, taller evergreen screening for uh, privacy from the neighbor. The rear of the building, we have these terraced walls uh, at the back of the site to get us back down to the original grade and they're five to six foot wide minimum in most areas where I have, um, we have the deciduous trees. We've got a combination of uh, um, native fastigiata oak and native sweet gum that will, these are trees that are gonna be coming in at least at 18 to 20 feet in height and they'll shoot up, you know, up to the second and third story pretty soon. So to the left and right of that, it's the same grade as what you're showing. Uh, yes, the, the, actually to the right of it, there's a patio from the old building and that slopes down and then it all slopes back around. Okay. Yeah, you can see this, you can get a better feel of the slope here. Mm -hmm. and I think that's it. <laughs> can I ask you a question? The, um, the, one of the, are, are you still, um, landscaping the, the back in such a way that you're mitigating the water that is coming from a, a, up the street and going into the, the property that's, um, you know, I guess, was it north of, you know, yes. to the side yeah, of you. Because I know they had flooding issues, yeah. you know. So in addition to capturing the water, I'm sure that you right were your site. Yeah. Are you mitigating some of the river that was going behind there? Yeah, instead? what's happening is we have our infiltrators are under the lawn area back there, but right where the cursor is here, this is the rain garden. What, what we've done there is, if you can imagine when we were out there on the site, the neighboring property's elevation, we've contoured it down and created this whole area 
drops down about 30 inches to allow, and it's all, it's, it's lined with wetland plantings that can absorb that water and rock and this a particular sand and soil mixture. So that water will then settle there first, infiltrate in. In a large, massive storm, there's a, there will be a catch basin in there with a drain in it up at the higher elevation. So when that water runs up, it will then run in right along the edge of the property here. We have sort of a dry riverbed of stone and that'll help it run and, and slow it down and absorb in. And, and the addition of the plants, like if you remember what's out there right now and we, when we did our soil test even, the soil is almost like rock. It's not going, you know, water, very little is infiltrating into it. So it just runs right off and sheets in. And then because we have this, the retaining wall at the far end of the property, this whole wall is bringing it up. It's holding the water too, helping it infiltrate in that area as well. And could, Christina, could I, I have just have one comment and then we'll, I guess we're gonna open it up. Yes. So um, on, on the piece between the two, on the entry piece between the two buildings, I totally respect the desire to not go to some new third element. But I'm actually looking at, but if we're not going that route, then I think in some ways, I'm looking back to the February submission and the original design you had for what mm -hmm. was in between yeah. the two buildings. I think it looks better, personally. I feel like the piece that's there now is kind of not, it's not clear to me, like, if it's meant to be sort of a more modern thing or as it part. It looks a lot more modern, yeah. Or if it's, but maybe not enough to be really, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm just saying I think it was almost better the way you had it. I'm looking on my screen. I have the one that you, I know the public <coughs> can see it. I have the one you submitted in February, and I actually think it looks, I, I think it looks, I think it looks better. But the other, the other question I have is, what didn't you say something about trying actually to save the porch on the south side at the last meeting? Because the, the porch is sort of falling down on the existing house. Rebuilt. Yeah, hmm? it has to be rebuilt. We weren't you going to rebuild? I thought we were going to turn it perpendicular and have it in front of the front. Yeah, I think front it's, door. And is that what that was? This was. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And is that idea still? viable yes <laughs> well i mean not for me i mean i'm asked you're the designer no I, I just you know it's funny but um we like the idea of like really kind of recreating it just because it's it has some really nice detail not and it's not over over overly ornate it just has um mm -hmm. it's carved a certain way and it has a um, chamfered corner um i think uh, maybe we have it do we have it? Yeah, let's look at the photos. Let's look at the photos of the old house. And then the doorway will fall into shadow, which will be sort of nice. It will recede more. You know, since we're going to restore the old building, uh, original idea was that, well, you know, the porch doesn't work where it is and it has to be rebuilt. Why not? turn it and put it where we need it mm -hmm. and replicate the details, which um, do you think you can blow that up a little? And is that idea still viable or not anymore? Yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, I have mixed feelings because, you know, uh -huh. one thing that I think we knew and we might all agree on is that the roof had to be quiet and low as possible. And that's why I like the idea that maybe it's a, there's a dormer there just to let a little bit of light in, but it's really quiet as can be. Okay. And, um, I think, you know, right now, um, I think every entry needs a roof covering. It, it really must. So right now we have just a little rectangular shape that pulls out in a very minimalist way. This is a completely different idea. But do you see, um, these are not like, um, you know, these are delicate columns. And if they're brand new, they would be probably pretty nice. And a reference to the old house. Okay. Thank that you. was our original idea. Um, I'd like to move that we open the public hearing. For a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Is there anyone that wishes to speak to this application? Hello, everyone. I'm Leslie Walter, 40 Clinton Avenue. I live right next door. 
Uh, I'd like to address two topics that haven't been talked about tonight. One is old or heritage trees, and the other is parking. So about the trees, I would hope that the Tree Commission has some teeth in the proposal to tear out four heritage trees from this property. I'm using New York State guidelines for heritage trees. I do understand why two of the four need to be uh, taken out. They would obstruct new construction. Basically, they sit in an active work zone. But the eastern pine in the north corner and the large antique yew, yews live for 800 years, in front of the old home, do not obstruct construction. Their root protection zones can be worked around. In other US towns, Austin, Texas, Portland, Oregon, Palo Alto, California, these trees are considered heritage trees, and they are protected like, heritage, like historic buildings. We seem to have the idea they're expendable. I asked the board why we got to go to Wave Hill or Bronx Botanic to look at a big, beautiful tree. Why can't we have them here in our own village on a, tr on a street that's big enough to show them off? Uh, that's it for trees. I also want to briefly comment on the landscape plan. It's a beautiful plan. I asked the landscaper to give greater consideration to local conditions, and by that I mean permanent deer population on Clinton Avenue. There is a large deer population. There's four to six every year. And a lot of what he's chosen is very edible. Um, and the hedge that's in front is bare five winter months of the year. That means cars on the other side of that hedge will be 95% visible. And also, I mean, I ask for more evergreens, not more deciduous trees. So that's it. Uh, the parked cars out in the front. I want the board to consider relaxing the rule that supports a parking mandate. That's a minimum number of spaces per apartment on streets like Clinton that have adequate street parking and are not commercial districts. Lower Clinton Avenue happens to be in that half mile zone of the so-called transit-oriented development. I live there, I walk to the train, I walk to readers, I do not walk to stop and shop. People need cars in a suburb, but village law requires too many parking spaces for the two bedroom apartments. When the Westchester Planning Board weighed in on this particular property, they said that 17 required spaces for 11 apartments is too much. People are looking for places to live, not parking lots. Each two-bedroom apartment owner needs a car, I get it. But why load up the front yard with cars? I asked the board to consider eliminating two more parking spaces from Miss Griffin's, Miss Griffin's scheme, B, uh, screen, scheme C so that two, not four, cars are parked in the front yard. Owners can be issued residential street permits or maybe not everybody wants two cars. Uh, by the way, many towns across the country are eliminating or relaxing their parking mandates. Again, people are looking for a place to live. They're not looking for parking lots, especially in a highly walkable zone, which Lower Clinton is. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Others to speak on this, please? Yes, please. <laughs> Okay. Um, sorry, I'm nervous. Um, I have always loved walking. Could you enter? I'm sorry. Could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, I'm gonna. My name is Ruby Eliopoulos, um, and I am the owner of 54 Clinton. Okay. Which is thank you. Two houses up the street. I have always loved walking up Clinton Avenue for Broadway. The surrounding single-family homes made me feel transported to another time. It is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful and unique stretches of homes in Dobbs Ferry. When my husband and I bought the Dobbs Ferry Women's Club, it was very important to us to build something that stayed within the character of the neighborhood. We believe that Dobbs Ferry can always use more housing, but it's important that anything built in the village fit in with the character of the neighborhood that it's being built in. As designed, 34 Clinton does not look like a single family house. Removing the connecting elevator would make it look like two buildings instead of one. You don't need to put the elevator in both buildings. 
Not everybody's looking for an elevator. One of the buildings could contain the elevator and the other one could not, and then they'd be separated. They would look like two buildings. Um, I also agree with Leslie about the um, ancient and healthy trees. If a tree is healthy and it's been around for hundreds of years, I, I feel like it's tragic to cut it down. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Leslie's husband, Carl. I want to thank the board, uh, the architects and the developer for looking at our numerous letters over the last uh, couple of months that we've worked on this project. And I, and I want to say that I think a lot of progress has been made, but I, but I still think it's too big. It, do, it doesn't fit in with the character of the street, whether it's the elevator building or the size. I think this building is too big. Now, there's many ways you can mitigate this. Uh, one of them uh, is leaving some of the trees in the front yard. Since Scheme C here has a very large front yard on the side, that yew tree could easily survive there and help scale down the size of these two buildings. Uh, there's a very large eastern pine right where the entrance is that could also be helpful in this regard so that's my first comment of two second one is over the over the second uh, iteration of this plan and this and what we've seen tonight the architect has gone to a great deal of trouble to make the new construction uh, look like old construction but if you look at the southern elevation of the old building, then you're going to see that a very, in, that a very interesting uh, part of that building has been standardized and been changed uh, so that the whole building has become more or less just like this rather than having multiple gables in the south perspective. So I would ask that uh, we don't get all caught up in the front yard and parking and trees and the tower in the back corner. We're trying to preserve this old building so that the block still has some character left. Thank you very much for all your patience with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good evening, my name is Suyash. I live at 18 Clinton Avenue, so on the right side of uh, this property uh, right next door. My wife and I moved in in the fall of 2022, and so as recent purchasers, we desperately recognize that Dobbs Ferry needs more housing. And with the right project, I would actually be standing here speaking in strong support, despite, frankly, the inconvenience of <coughs> new construction while raising a newborn. And yet there are three key issues that I feel must be resolved for this project to meet the high standards of Dobbs Ferry. Those are size, parking, and community. On size, all of us neighbors have invested in the area based on a zoning code that we expect to be upheld. The MDRH code clearly states that this must look like one or two single family homes. And not just from the street, but from the homes around it as well from all sides. This new building is too wide, too tall, and too deep to even come close. The original looks a lot like a single family home. The new one is over double the footprint, and there are six families on the right side of this building that will effectively be looking at two houses connected together, a behemoth of a wall, and four stories high because of the way that the land slopes. You can ask 100 people, you can ask 1,000 people. Nobody's gonna say that this looks like a single family home. And so I really do believe it is contrary to code and contrary to the rules within which we frankly invested in this area, all of us who are speaking today. On parking, I'd just like to remind you when we started, there were 11 parking spots in the front and we were told that it just had to be that way. And now there are four. So there's, there's generally more that can be done than we are told. Um, I am thankful that it has been improved and I think it reflects hard work and creativity. And yet I also think more needs to be done. As it currently stands, there will be four parking spots a car length away from my living room window. 
I just don't think that's reasonable. I don't think that's reasonable in a residential area. And I do think that there are reasonable solutions that can be implemented. Um, I'm not an expert in any of this, but I do believe that it is actually possible to put these in the back. My understanding is the exit to the rear would somehow reduce the amount of mass that they could build by 20 square feet. I don't know, like is selling another 20 square feet really worth putting four cars in the front? Doesn't seem like it to me. Maybe as Leslie has suggested, you can reduce the parking requirements. I do think there are solutions, but I just really don't think that the way it currently stands makes a whole lot of sense. Um, and the last point is on community. And you know, I, I, I just don't really see a world in which there's a whole lot of families who are going to move into two bedroom apartments up in Dobbs Ferry. Um, it's very hard to do with kids and work from home and having an office. And I really do think this project would be improved if some of the units were three bedrooms. Perhaps that means going from 11 to 10 units and making a couple of three bedroom units because we would be excited to have people move next door with kids. Um, so that was, that's more of a suggestion, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is James Kybird. I live at 70 Clinton Avenue. I'm the one that's responsible for the tower that was talked about earlier. Um, I recall Rob saying something at our last site visit, and I'm not sure I have it exactly as he said it, but he said kind of wistfully, I wish we could have earlier discussions on projects like this before they get so far along. Um, I can now say amen. I wasn't allowed to talk at the site visit, so I'm gonna say amen now. <clears throat> as we look at this new iteration of the 6034 Clinton effort, I ask us to embrace the history we share around this zone. The years we spent crafting the vision plan are sharing that process together. Over the 30 years ago, we started this. That sharing of that process birthed a sense of place so strong that we created a special zone with a specific description for that row of homes on Clinton. That's pretty special. I want to embrace the energy and the creativity and the work that's been put into this project by the wonderful people that I admire, John, Christina, Karen, Dippy, amazing work. And is Karen here? Um, and I, the wonderful, caring folks that live only in, in the only seven parcels that this zone is, seven parcels. Everyone wants the best results for improvements, as you've heard tonight. Even the former owners of 34 have approached, 34 Clinton have approached me. Rich Gaby, uh, who's also a resident, is in Florida. Uh, his, his son Frankie, I thought, might be, be showing up. I know you've gotten letters from wet, Wits End residents. My nature is to support projects. You heard me on the 54 project the master's IEC, and the meetings at Dipti's. But as far as I know, no one that lives in the MDRH zone supports this apartment building that is now called the residences, simply contrary to code. MDRH is intended to reinforce the existing pattern of larger historic homes in estates that have been subdivided into multiple dwelling units while maintaining the exterior appearance of a single family home. The code is a clear statement and gives us a sense of place to launch a design. If you fail to design, you design for failure. The architecture of the residences is A plus as far as I'm concerned. The design the design is a cannibalization of a distinctive historic home to decorate and justify the squat mass of an apartment building. This could have and should have been addressed early on, as Rob mentioned a few weeks ago in the front yard on the Sunday visit. 
At the subsequent planning board meeting, the board made following comments, quotes, I love the row of homes on Clinton. It just doesn't, this just doesn't seem to fit in. The proposed building does not appear as a single family home in character with the others on Clinton. This is what you gentlemen and gentlewoman have said. The not is overwhelming, creating one massive building. Three plans were presented, A and a new B, C. C was preferred. The applicants agreed to include those concerns in their request for the next public hearing, but it seems the concerns were disregarded. Yes, niceties have been added, it is improved, but we are still presented with a massive, in relation to the Clinton row of houses, apartment building. This building is suitable for Broadway, but not for the MDRH. Now, the applicants are really adamant about conforming. And I think what they're conforming is to the, to the sliding scale rather than to what they need to be conforming to, which is the confirmed code, 30, 335. There are so many, without the sliding scale, there are so many opportunities to design a flow, a spaciousness, a proportionality, a sense of place in relation to this sweet old manse and those others on Clinton. Free of the constriction of the sliding scale, they should be able to have at it. Design historic single-family homes that have multiple dwelling units. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I would move that we close the public hearing. Anybody online? Anybody online? <coughs> Is this board, um, you, the, um, if you close the public hearing, then a decision needs to be made within, you know, if the board wants to continue deliberating, you know, you might want to consider yeah. keeping the public hearing. Oh, well, we can keep it open. Yeah, I think we should. Um, <clears throat> So I want to say, first of all, I really appreciate the comments tonight, and I'll, and I'll, for, I'll start by cherry picking the ones that I particularly like, and maybe the applicant can um, talk about them. First is the, the saving of the trees. Um, maybe uh, I think it would. Be, I think it makes you can address it. I think but then I also think it's worth, and we've done this before. We have a landscape architect on who's another on-call consultant who I would ask that we get an independent opinion from uh, from our the villages um, uh, landscape consultant but if you want to sure. take a second now to address those yeah. those two trees the um, there's the beech tree which we've noticed the large one that's in the construction and it is uh, damaged has declining so it's definitely a tree and as as is the Colorado spruce the two trees that were mentioned the yew um, could be you know and I think that I could speak with our the yew is in the front lawn area now that was in parking and drive that could be uh, kept it's not a it's not a native tree which is what we're trying to do with ever the comment about everything being eaten by deer the majority of the plants are native and they're selected for to be as deer proof as possible um, so that there is definitely a sensitivity to the deer um, in, the, in, the, in the selection. Uh, the white pine um, is, uh, you know, I could quite, you know, it, it is at the very front. We could take another look at it. I tend to get leery, and I think I mentioned at one of the previous, in, in a location like that, there is some uh, depth in that. When a pine gets to that size, they're very top heavy in the storms lately, and it's been known with the power lines in that area the top and I've seen that happen numerous times so it's not not the most beautiful tree out there um, it's got one side of it is so so but um, you know we it's not like I was trying we to can eliminate continue the public trees just to the say, um, let's go mm -hmm. could you oh, just direct your comments sorry or not the um, yes sorry. and we um and we do have quite a number I know the comment about the uh, I don't have the plan right in front of me, but we've got well more than 20 or so evergreens going in on either side. 
So I, th I think on the tree issue, I, I again, I, I'd ask the village if we can have an independent assessment of the two trees, and I would lean towards doing everything we can to save those two trees. And if it means with that, the other tree, taking some of the top out of it so that it becomes less of a wind. I mean, I know that there are strategies. Yeah, that yeah. We, we have a white, an old white pine that we topped, and it looked ugly for a little while, but then it, now it looks okay. Yeah, so I, I think that the issue of those two trees is something that could be really something we could address. The other thing that um, one of the speakers, I'm sorry, I don't remember, it's the first speaker mentioned, is um, the elimination of the, the reduction of the parking requirement. I would be 100% for that. We have to ask the rest, you know, the rest of the board has to decide. Uh, I, I, I think I totally agree. And I think it conforms, I think that idea of waiving those parking spaces make that it was down to a ratio of one per unit for me would be, that would be something I would adopt. I'll say that, so people will say, well, people will bring their two cars and they'll park on Clinton and Clinton gets pretty parked up when Masters is in session. I would say the only time cars I've ever seen, the only speeding ticket I've gotten in Dobbs Ferry, and I live up there, is on Clinton on a day when there were no cars parked on either side because you can glide down that road and you're doing 40 miles an hour. And the only time you don't see speeding on that road is when it is parked up, the more the better. So I personally would be uh, in favor of eliminating the on-site parking and allowing those, the, if, if people come with additional cars, that they would find spaces on, on the street. Um, I, you know, I, I guess in doing my own, because before this meeting, anticipating this discussion, I was trying to sort of make my own balance sheet, right? So first of all, I, I and one of the things I had on I think, first of all, it does comply with the vision plan in terms of a goal of getting density closer to downtown. My, I had a very, I was surprised by the letter that we got that said it doesn't comply with zoning. I read it exactly the opposite. When I read this, that MDRH is intended to reinforce the existing pattern of larger historic homes and estates that have been subdivided into multiple dwelling units while maintaining the exterior appearance of a single family home. I think that's exactly what this does. They're talking about maintaining the pattern of having houses, there could be multiple houses that are subdivided and that look like they are um, uh, single, you know, maintain basically their single family appearance. And I actually, so I actually, one of the things I had on the positive side of my ledger was that it does comply, I think it does actually comply with the zoning. And the other things that I think also kind of, because it is big, there's no question it's big, and, it would be, I, you know, it's a, I guess people think it's always nicer if it's smaller, but on the other side, there is the fact that, you know, it's providing residential uses near downtown and within walking distance of transit. It's creating a permanently affordable housing unit. It's mitigating the flooding from the streets and the properties upstream of the subject property. And it's attractive, I think, the, with my age, with my, aid, with my um, historic, the architecture review board had on. I think the developer and the architect have made significant modifications since the early rounds to accommodate the concerns that we've stated about the massing and the scale of it. And the massing of it has changed a great deal. So I don't think it's perfect by any means. And I think there's no question that the scale is, um, is a factor, but I think the, in, with the tree and the parking issues addressed, which seems like they could be, I, I feel like it's overall, it comes out on the positive side for me in terms of what it accomplishes and how it's being done. Um, I, I think that Mr. Sirash uh, had a, um, you submitted a letter as well, right? Or, yeah, yeah um, his suggestion of having some three bedroom units, I mean, it could, reduce the number of parking spaces, add some families. I mean, I, I would suggest that you look at that. Maybe, it may also mean that we lose, I think there is a trade-off between that and 
having. Yeah, I mean, we're old people, right? So. And having more permits. <laughs> <and having, laughs> and having families. Having more having more permits here and an affordable dwelling. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, no, the affordable yeah. dwelling automatically goes for four units or more. Right. Or anything above four units. So, if so, you do, so there would be at least one. Yeah. Even if the number of units. I mean, so aging in place. We're thinking about that too, right? <laughs> I intend to live in a tiny little accessory <laughs> dwelling unit behind James Kibbert's house. <laughs> um, other than that, I, I tend to agree with Will, with yeah. Rob. I mean, yeah, I, 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 go, ahead. No. Uh, go ahead. I mean, the only the only thing that um, keeps glaring at me is that it, it it does look like it's two different units, um, and I think intended, that's right. right. And it's 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 kind of Christina's way of designing, I believe. You, I've noticed in, in, in some of your projects, you do have this contrast going on um, with the materials in one versus the other. Um, and so I feel like when we think about an estate or a sprawling house, we tend to think that it's all one. Uh, and, and the materials right now, it reads differently even though the architectural um, uh, details are very similar and you've worked really hard to keep it consistent. But when you do, when I look at that, I do see two different things going on. I don't feel like it's one, one complete estate or home. But I, I don't think that's the intent. But that's not the intent. But I'm and, just and I don't actually think that's even the intent of the code. I think the intent of the code is that whatever you would do to the existing old house, if you make it into smaller units, right. it should maintain its single family house appearance, which it does. I, see. I don't think the code precludes the idea of there being an adjacent, a nearby uh, house of a similar kind of scale and character. I don't think. I, my reading of the code was not that it meant that it had to be one big thing, which I actually think would be more imposing mm -hmm. than the way they're approaching the site right now. Right. No, I like it. Don't get me wrong. I'm just, I'm just trying to interpret what I'm reading, the, the different comments and letters that I'm reading, and that's what I kind of get from it. Yeah, sure. Because no. I, I wanted to think about the design of this of this building is that I well I you know I walked down the Avenue I used to live right across the border in Dobbs Ferry right nearby and I know they street really well and I just love these big lawns and I wanted you know we we actually could have put we could have had a, a couple of houses maybe and gone to up to the 40 foot setback mm -hmm. but we actually made it twice as deep as the minimum setback because I felt like that was kind of sacred. And that is another, and having uh, the proportions of the building very similar, where the facade isn't any, it's about 27 feet wide, the main facade. I, we matched the old one, we didn't, have, we didn't have to match it exactly, but we knew that that is a common proportion you see in old buildings. You, know, you wouldn't have a facade 50 feet long. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the um, pattern that exists, we tried to recreate, especially on the facade facing the street. But because we have such a huge front yard, to get the number of units we were trying to get and still meet the code for number of units, we pushed it in the back to preserve the front yard. So, and yeah, we deliberately wanted them to be different so that actually when you turn the rendering at certain angles, we're showing you this one so you, it gives you a lot of information, but sometimes you don't even see the link. You know, the idea was that these were two different houses. Mm -hmm. They're like sister houses. They have something in common, variations on the theme, but they're not going to match. We can't match that house. It's so right. beautiful and we don't want to. Okay, thank you. Um, if we wanted to talk about West Parking as a board, I mean, obviously, it's a sensitive subject in Dobbs Ferry. Um, there are a lot of people that are pushing for more parking, not less. But I understand the argument for less, and I understand how the less parking in the front there is, the more attractive the front yard is going to be. Is there any way we want to further that discussion? Well, there's just two spaces now. There are four. And an optional two more if they want to use them. Oh, okay. Right? 
Is that the way it's, in the, the way it's currently drawn in, in the plan? It looks like there are two pairs. Right, we have two pairs, and then to the, and then we have the future. Like, what's the total? How many total to make your count? Seven. How, how many? You, no, how many are you counting on being in the front? In the front, there'll be four as as built, and then two futures. So there will be six oh, okay. to meet the requirement. If you lessen the requirement, um, you know, then it's up to you. They could all be land banked as air, an area that we can. But part and if it was one, if it was one space per unit, you would have how many? We have them all. In you'd the have design. how many? How many would be? How many total units are you required to have? There's there are eleven, there are 11, units. 11 units, and we have eleven parking spaces inside, inside the building right now. So as shown, we have to provide a two space variance. We, as shown, you would have to yes, these two spaces here. We have two, two, and two here. These are this is the area which we future Western County. You wanted to eliminate two. I would not do that. Have all the, all the <laughs> site coverage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in effect, just to be clear, in effect, we already are reducing the parking requirement by two spaces. Yes. Okay. We're being asked to. Oh, right, we're being asked to. Yeah. Um, and then my second question is, how was the bedroom configuration chosen? Christina, are you the right person to talk about that? I mean, that? the number of the, How was the, the bedroom configuration? Are they all two bedroom units? Yeah, they're all two bedrooms. And was that chosen by, with the financial modeling? You know, how, how does that get decided upon? Well, um, worked with the owner, so, and he has experience to doing multifamily, and I do too. We're actually doing quite a bit. And the two bedroom, two bath, with the downscaling of families, you know, most have one or two kids. Um, they, one, you know, that this is a, Really, really popular, actually. In fact, I've spoken to um, developers who are also landlords, and they constantly tell me if it's only a one bedroom, there's more uh, of change of ownership because people are more in transition, want more space. Um, two bedrooms also more affordable than three bedrooms, and there's a huge aging population too. That still want two bedrooms, even if they only use, they use the second as an office. So it's a very attractive type of unit. Um, well, we also get more units, which is desirable from the village's standpoint, I think. So trying to increase density close to all the reasons, for all the reasons Rob brought up. Thank you. I think there's one other person who wants to speak over here. I totally agree with the aging in place. On the other hand, if you have a couple who comes up from the city, and <laughs> there are many such, to live in Dobbs Ferry, what do they want? They want an office, because somebody is always at home. With a two-bedroom, that can be a little iffy, and when a baby comes, that's even iffier. This is to support what Suyash was saying. Maybe not all of them should be two bedroom. There's not just one standard. There are several different types of families that come up here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. I chose to put in two, three bedrooms because when I spoke to my real estate broker, she said there are none. There are none in Dobbs Ferry. She gets calls all the time for three bedrooms, and she can't show them anything in Dobbs Ferry. So there is a need for three bedrooms. I mean, it's a, you have to eliminate, make less apartments, but there is definitely a need for three bedrooms. I mean, you have to understand for us, I mean, maybe the owner developer wants to say something. 
it's, that's wading into, I, I mean, I feel I'm uncomfortable weighing into issues of unit mix because that has to do with the, I mean, I, I agree with you. It's the, the more diversity there can be in general and housing types, the better. But whatever, I don't know what the math is around this building and what the marketing assumptions are. So I don't know if it's in our purview even to, I guess we could say we'd like to see more diversity in, un, in unit types, but I don't know if we can get a little out of our water. The chair is shaking his head, no. <laughs> no, not that. I think we need to move on. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. Correct. I mean, it seems like there are two things that are at least resolved. Right. One is we're going to make a, a different, we're going to try to do something about the two trees. How do we want to resolve the issue about the parking requirement? Well, we have to give them some guidance or say, you know, That's from my I mean. standpoint, we've already decreased the requirement. Yeah. Right. By 10, more I'd than 10%. Leave it alone. Hmm? I'd leave it alone. I mean, you're just going to be throwing them out onto the street pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. exactly. One street. But in this case, Clinton. this isn't Palisades. This is Clinton. There's, there's ex Rob's, I drive, I live at the top of that. Yeah, there. I drive, drive up there every day. day. Me too. There's, you know, 99.9% of the time, there's plenty of parking on Clinton. That's right. So I'm saying, why not? Why not allow, why not not have any of the parking in the front yard? Have this number of spaces that they have now underground, and the remaining spaces will be, they'll find spaces on Clinton. And then the entire front yard becomes green. Is right. Right? I mean, I'm not sure if that's a saleable. Could it be just in the resolution that all six of those spaces are land bank, that if you found that there was a problem, that the town would then be able to come back. The location is there. It's just lawn area. It could come, go back to parking. So the like building inspector. This is a condition. <laughs> of the Can we do that? Yeah, you. I mean, I mean, every time I've gone there, all three spaces in front of the of the house. Yeah, I mean, it does get. I mean, in fairness, it does get parked up. There's a sports event and so on. But I agree with you. In general, there's on-street parking on Clinton. You probably want the site plan to reflect the location. Of those spaces. Okay. You know, except for except when Masters is in session. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I know. That's. that's I mean, <laughs> no, I. No, no, I'm talking about when Masters is in session. The streets parked, and that's when people drive at the speed limit. <laughs> yeah, but also Other what times happens it's a if racetrack. you have people, if parking. it's a two bedroom and they're using one as an office, a lot of people working home and there's not a place to park. They have, you know. So we're because Masters well, is. You need to give the applicants some. Yeah. And we had a point Guys. where we, it's either the resolution or it's the next meeting, and you want to. Well, I think we want to hear the the tree results. Yeah, and, um, right. yeah. You know, but the tree results. But I months. think we should give we get to try to give direction around the parking. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think if, if, if those spaces are available to turn into parking, they're graded. They're just grass instead of um, asphalt. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like. If it's a problem, they can come back to the, right. you know, maybe so they maybe that could be building hard to say we want to put a couple of park spaces in our front yard. No, I don't. I don't think at this point we'd have to. I mean, you're, the board is already looking to get a uh, recommendation from your landscape architect. So, but couldn't it be written as though we're willing to leave the trees down? I think there's enough of the. Well, it's. I think there's enough of uh, site plan changes that this board might warrant. To see the new site plan yes. in terms of the parking potential. The new site the plan would show the two new trees and it could show this reduced parking the right. swing more of the parking being shown as swing parking in the front. Right. Yeah. And if and if your landscape architect has some concerns or whatever, you might want the applicant to address those yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay. 
Is, is are the members of the board comfortable with deferring that parking? I guess the, in the front yard and only have an underground parking, with the ability to create it easily in the future. If Somehow. we have the, if yeah. we have the, the uh, yeah, if we have uh, yeah. the safety hatch of going back and insisting. Yeah. 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 I'm comfortable, and I'm very curious because this is an issue that comes up again and again and again, yeah. and I'm curious to see how much parking we can actually reduce yes. without I agree. people starting to push back. So I think this is a, a low cost. This is a zero cost way to okay. to explore yeah. that issue. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. okay. Can you come back next month with those two issues? Yeah. Address? Yeah. And we'll have a resolution? And we'll bring we'll, a resolution. We'll have a resolution. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Thank you. Close the meeting. Oh, yeah. Oh, we have to um, adjourn the public hearing. Okay. Oh, yeah. All in favor? Thank you. Second. Second. Aye. Um, okay. Close the public hearing. No. Okay. Are you adjourn. closing it or are you adjourning it? Adjourn. 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 <laughs> All right. Thank you. Number three, seven Bramley Lane, public hearing for proposed replacement of railroad tie retaining wall with modular block retaining wall system. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Good evening. board members. My name is Tony Levisano, the owner of Seven Bramley, my wife, Nancy. Yeah, welcome back. We've been back. in the house about 40 years. So yes, we're aging in place as well. <laughs> okay, uh, as mentioned, we'd like to replace the existing deteriorated railroad tire retaining wall with a ready rock gravity wall uh, that is permanent and it will be vastly improvement aesthetically. Uh, since our last meeting, we have made um, progress. The first item that we have was the uh, site plan must show uh, uh, sediment control, silt fence, construction fence, as well as uh, protection of the uh, trees. Uh, we received the uh, neighbor's uh, plan on 9 March, and currently our contractor and engineer are working it, and we should have that available for the next meeting. So yes, we are working that. Sure. The second item is the memorandum of agreement for access. We have two contiguous properties, one uh, at 8 and one at 12 Beechwood uh, Court. Uh, we had a meeting with the owner on 6 March of 8. Number 12 was not available to discuss their issues and concerns to include site access, storing of material, trees, and restoration. I had thought that we pretty much have reached agreement. It is a small piece of property, and whatever material the contractor will excavate, he will take away the same day. No room to stockpile that material. Whatever material he may need, for the next day's work to include the ready rock or gravel, yes, in small quantities, but just sufficient to keep the project moving on time. And they were also concerned about the schedule of the uh, project. The contractor estimates it to take two weeks. It could probably be done sooner. Uh, he was also concerned the neighbor about delays. Well, you know, in my former life, I was a chief of construction and a deputy with projects for the Corps of Engineers, and I can keep a project on schedule. He will finish on time. You know, God forbid, unless there's a hurricane or weather delay, unforeseen uh, guard condition, the project will finish easily within the uh, two-week period. So we're still working the MOA. One of the neighbors is away for five weeks, so we'll address it with him. Uh, he has a very small section, eight feet. Uh, the other gentleman we're still working with. The new big issue right now is one tree that is very close to the uh, wall, and its roots have, in fact, encroached onto my property and are under the existing uh, retaining wall. I am now talking to an arborist, uh, Paul Bunyan, who's looking at the tree to see what, if anything, can be done to salvage that tree. If not, it would be removed. The owner of eight Beechwood is amenable to having the tree removed if it needs to be removed. So we're still massaging the MOAs and we're still working it, and hopefully we'll get to a positive resolution between the uh, two of us. Three of us, actually. Um, the next item is three regarding the uh, drain pipe. The engineer has removed the drain pipe. 
As I mentioned at the last meeting, there are 100 tons of gravel in this material, ready rock. In fact, it's slitted uh, vertically, you know, at every section. So it acts as a giant dry well. So the uh, pipe that the neighbor was concerned about is being removed. And I have that drawing. I want to give the board or the village a complete package rather than give it to you guys piecemeal. Uh, warning. So we're working that. I do have it. The next one is the calculations. He does have that. I'll submit that as well. And as far as the property line showing on the elevation section, I do have that. So hopefully by the next meeting, I should have all the technical requirements submitted to the uh, visual to the village, as well as uh, an MOA that is, you know, close, if not fully executed. My sincere desire is to come to an amicable agreement with my two neighbors and give them a beautiful wall rather than what they're looking at now, which is a deteriorated retaining wall that's you know, a life safety issue, and it's actually taking away property value from their home. <coughs> and this will enhance the value of their home. I say they'd be hard pressed, number eight, to sell this house with that existing retaining wall there. The adjoining house, the Eichert house, they had an issue with the uh, retaining wall, and the uh, owner had to replace it before they were able to sell it. Yeah. So rather than saying it's going to take away value, it will, in fact, add value and make the house much more sellable. But there's no action for us to take tonight. 29. Is that right? No. no. Okay. There's an update. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me, this is a public hearing, though. So nope. you go. Okay. Yeah. We'd have to adjourn. I don't think we, the next, we, so okay. Next okay. Well, I don't know if anybody has come. But we, have, we haven't opened a public hearing yet. No, we have to. Yeah. We did? No, you got to. We, we haven't opened this yeah, one. Yeah, for now. Yeah. Yeah, I move that we open the public hearing. Second. That's what I was saying. Hey, public go. hearing is open. Aye. Um, yeah. Is there anybody here to speak about this? No, you want to? Anybody online? No? No, I didn't think so. Should we no, close we the public it. hearing? No, we're going to continue it, right? Adjourn. To okay. adjourn. 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 adjourn public hearing until next Second. meeting. Second. All in favor? All Aye. in favor. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you, see next, you next month. month. Yeah. Next item on our agenda, item number 486 Maple Street, public hearing for proposed two lot subdivision and new fa two family dwelling. <clears throat> for those of you in the audience, we are halfway through the meeting. We're not even close. <laughs> yeah. So. The things are going to start to move considerably yeah. faster, yeah, yeah, yeah. is my guess. John Boot and You need to take a, a break. <laughs> Bring in the drinks. John's boosting off. Uh -huh. Next one is a new lot. Maple. Well, that's a created lot. That's pretty easy. That's this guy. Yeah, this yeah. is the, yeah, you remember the house nice, yeah. that we asked him to yeah. fix it up, yeah. try to make it a little better. Yeah. They, um, they did. Yeah. I mean, it's still. That's not right. Yes. Yes, because they're creating a new It's a new unit. It, it, it is. Yes. They did a bunch of They had a bunch of them. It's an uncle compared to the old one. <laughs> <laughs> He loves property that we took him on. Uh, good evening, board members. This is Donald Majorano from Community Designs and Engineering. Uh, so just to recap from where we left off at the last meeting and give some summary to the overall project, uh, we are proposing a two-lot subdivision at 86 Maple Street. Uh, basically, the property um, goes from Maple to DeVoe Street, and DeVoe Street is where our proposed two-family dwelling will be located. A few months ago, we went to the zoning board with respect to uh, multiple uh, variances uh, that had to do with setbacks of the proposed home, lot sizes, and also the existing dwelling at 86 Maple Street needed some variances because of the new lot size and setbacks to that uh, dwelling, but that dwelling itself will not be changed at all. Uh, most of the homes in that area have very similar uh, lot sizes. They're sort of you know broken down into the middle. So trying to keep within the character of the neighborhood with the 
uh, subdivision and as well as the uh, two-family uh, dwelling. So basically, um, uh, next page. So yeah, so the, as you can see here in this map, um, that in shaded in yellow is our proposed uh, lot. To the, uh, next to it is another um, lot that's similar to ours, and then that's it. So there's no uh, dwelling actually to the right of us, and to the left, I think it's 43 uh, DeVoe Street, just seeing the down picture to the right. Um, from the last meeting, uh, really what we did was uh, we received the memo from the consulting engineer. We responded to those comments with respect to the drainage. Obviously, the all of the new impervious area will be captured on site with stormwater mitigation. Um, we did receive just a couple days ago or the other day, uh, two basic comments that we could easily adhere to with respect to just some of the you know ways to calculate it whether it be maybe adding a drywall or so to the overall uh, project um, basically drainage there's you know drainage at the front of the property and the rear rear of the property again to capture everything um, with respect to the overall house design there was yeah some comments uh, to add some architectural um, detail elements of the home so we tried to look at that so basically in the front <coughs> elevation uh, we added some corbel detail elements to the gable a um, different type of material element a shake siding that has a little swoop to it where the corbels will be at the bottom of that a return rake uh, soffit that goes fully across the front elevation sort of brings the scale of the house down a little bit uh, we added some shutters and took a little bit of look of the stone on the bottom uh, garage area, which wraps around the side. Uh, it sort of mimics where the platform really is. Um, and yeah, I think that pretty much sums it up. Thank you. <clears throat> I move public, open the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody? Here to speak. Yes, please. Uh, Paul Kaplan, uh, 87 Maple Street. Uh, so I'm <clears throat> across Maple from the existing dwelling, uh, but uh, this lot is sort of part of my view shed, so to speak, because uh, <clears throat> from my upper floor I can see well into it. Uh, I haven't followed this. Um, project yet I'd just be interested in hearing uh, I felt like the previous uh, building on that side of DeVoe Street came awfully close to the property line I don't know if variances were involved for that but um, my own feeling is that there's already quite a bit of congestion on DeVoe and that uh, absorbing virtually the entirety of the lot in the structure is not really conducive to the overall feel of the neighborhood. Yes, houses are close together. I'm only a few feet from my neighbor on one side, um, but uh, uh, I'd just be interested in hearing what the proportions, the coverage of the lot are, and how that factors into the need for a variance or not. Thank you. I, as I assume. I assume the the plans that we've got are conformed. Yes, and they received the variances yep. they needed. Right. You want to just review what the, the what the variances were? Uh, mm. There's a lot. Mm. Of them. There's like lot two. Well. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So, want me to read them all? There's sure. um there's 13 variances they received. Um, 13. a lot area of 1,068 for lot one. Um, Lot depth of 21.35 feet on lot one, rear yard setback of 3.3 feet on lot one, building coverage of 8.9% on lot one, impervious coverage 11.1% on lot one, lot area per dwelling of 534 square feet on lot one, lot area of 1,098 square feet on lot two, lot depth of 22.55 feet on lot two, rear yard setback of 10.17 feet on lot two, Side yard setback of three feet on lot two, combined side yard setback of five feet on lot two, 
lot coverage of 13.3% on lot two and lot area per dwelling of 548 square feet on lot two. Who gave them all those variances? <laughs> I mean, the, in, you know, well, in fairness to, to them, the lot is not build. I mean, the lot's exactly the size of the lots on the other lots on the block. And it would be unbuildable um, if those variances were not granted. So I think um, I think the, the one thing that might uh, that I don't I don't I don't think it would really prove very much. But I mean, it would be interesting to see a uh, footprint, which we asked other applicants to do. Uh, a kind of a figure round plan of the, you know, the tax lots and the street and the existing footprints so that the numbers aside, because my guess is none of the houses on um, DeVoe conform <laughs> to the existing zoning because it's, a, it's, a, it's an oddity. We could discuss whether or not there should have been an entirely different zone just around that. but. None of, none of them can actually conform. So having said that, it, it, to get a sense of whether or not the building overall feels like it is, and I suspect the answer will be yes, but I think it would be worth proving it. But if you show the footprint of the proposed building next to sort of in context on a map with just the footprints of the other existing buildings, it would answer the question of whether or not this thing is overall in scale with the rest of the neighborhood. I suspect it is, frankly, but we could, um, we could do that extra step of demonstrating that uh, um, the building footprint is comparable to the other uh, buildings in the neighborhood. Yeah, but the, they're existing. I mean, this is a new building. Right? so. Right, so we could, as we've done elsewhere, ask to see the footprint of what's proposed in the context of the neighborhood, right? With the footprints of the existing buildings to see if it, to yeah. see. I suspect that the answer is does look like it's in the same scale as the other buildings, but. I mean, I'm just, I'm just looking at Google Maps and you can see yeah, I'm that too. It's, yeah, um, they're fast. It, it seems completely in character with the rest of the street. Yeah. yeah. And uh, clearly our zoning code is a little bit, uh, over ambitious for that particular area. So well, that must have been the ZBA's position. Do we? Yeah, did, sure. Did we get any, exactly any kind of document from them that discusses their rationale? Um, no. I mean, we. Um, there will be a resolution that we can provide the board, if you like. Um, that should be completed by next meeting. A few houses up on the same street underwent similar approvals and variances, almost like identical. The yeah. Well, I tend uh, to think Alan's right. Yeah, I mean, it's I think I, mean, the neighbor. I don't want to hold up the project right. for no good reason. If we, okay. have, we have something we really want to see, you know, then we should right. ask for it. But right. um, we did ask for the architectural changes, and they've done. It is better. I did. I think a neighbor wants to comment too. When you. Oh, we have somebody who yeah. speak, please. Thank you. Good evening. I'm DeSan Davis from 84 Maple Street, and I'm here in support of the wonderful Maple Street and DeVoe Street neighborhood community and in support of additional housing in the neighborhood. Um, I do agree that it's uh, a dense neighborhood um, and don't disagree about the, the size of the property in general, um, but I do want to really clarify a few things um, because considering the size of the property and how much of the land area it covers, um, I'm particularly concerned about the water retention. Um, I know that um, as a resident, um, the adjacent property owner and I at 43 DeVoe Street um, have discussed damage to the retaining wall in the six years that I've been there from flooding, from rain damage. Um, over time, um, these this new property, I believe, though I don't find these drawings very 
easy to understand and they sure haven't been explained in the hearing. I think they're trying to raise the property and build a retaining wall between their two properties. Um, and I, I just want to make sure that we're carefully thinking about that and where that water's going and how that's going to affect the other retaining walls in the area. Um, especially thinking about 100 year storm levels, <coughs> about when the rain falls at a rapid pace. Um, there's not very much land area around that building to contain that water. Um, and um, and I know that the former owner of the house at the 86 Maple Street side um, also discussed having water issues. So I really do want to make sure that that's fully addressed um, and and that, you know, I just <laughs> I ask you as the board um, who understands these things to really think about that carefully and understand this retaining wall and how all those pieces are being built together. Um, the second one um, is um, that I, I attended the pre-submission hearing and there was some comment in the pre-submission hearing about no trees on site. Um, there is definitely a tree right at the corner of what seems like the corner of 86 Maple Street original property and the subdivision to the new lot. Um, and I wanna clarify where that tree is because it's growing out of the retaining wall. Um, and I really would like that to be fixed with any retaining wall construction, with any retaining wall um, modifications because we are then building into a structure that's inherently unstable due to a living tree um, growing out of the retaining wall. Um, so I, I wanna really carefully understand those property lines and, and how those pieces are going together. Um, and then finally, um, with reference to the recent two family structure that was built at 33 DeVos Street, uh, when that building was constructed, and, and I don't remember this being discussed in any of the meetings, um, the building has two large, ugly fuel tanks in the backyard. Um, they're visible to many of the neighboring houses. They're gonna rust over time. I still don't see on the plans what the heating plan is for this house. I do see air conditioners mentioned, but nothing about heating. And I know that gas lines aren't being run to new properties. Uh, at least that's my understanding. So I really wanna make sure that we're not making the same mistake again and putting external fuel tanks when we have um, electric and heating and cooling options that have a low impact on the neighborhood, both from the look and from the energy usage. Um, so those are things I just haven't heard discussed yet. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank do you, you want to address some of yeah, these? Just quickly on the last one, the applicant is looking to, to do electric heating uh, for this home. So obviously the, that would have no uh, propane tanks. We can't because the moratorium get obviously natural gas. Yeah. I assume you mean heat pumps. Heat pumps, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then, well, electric for heating, but no propane tanks imposed on this uh, site. Uh, for the drainage, 100%. Yes. So. The, basically what it is the proposed retaining walls are very minor um it's really just that so the house is not you know elevated out of the ground so much so i think the back there's a two foot high retaining wall um and the units will be below that wall so there'll be no impact i mean we're kind of almost the furthest down on the downhill slope so all the water's sort of running downhill so you know there's nothing really the, the units won't be anywhere adjacent to any building you know next to it and it is you know 10 feet away from the side property lines uh, there is a retaining wall there retaining walls are really you know at the property lines but right outside the property line so that tree is like basically you know look from the survey but it's basically on the neighbor's property but you know literally like right on the property line per se so we're not trying to remove any trees for the proposed uh, project but it's but who's responsible for whatever this issue that was raised about the condition of that there is of that wall and the tree that's yes yeah, so the, the tree on the right side is on the the neighbor to the right technically on their property so i don't know how to you know sort of it's not in your well, yeah tricky to you know whether it has to be you know proposed to be removed i don't know yeah if, if the applicant is able to do so because of where it lies so. there was a question in one of the memos about the infiltrators being within 10 feet of the rear lot line um did that did that require a variance yes yeah, so that no no variance on it infiltrators just a question from the consulting engineer which we it was like yesterday that we just got back, so we didn't have time to respond to it. So basically, there is no basement to our home, so that's why it's closer to the home. And then the 86 Maple Street is owned by the applicant as well, so it's the rear yard yeah. of there. There's no house, you know, next to it. So to show in cross-section what it's like 
at those units with the level that they're at between the property and the height of that house and the basement of our home as well. Well, I'm sure Anthony's, Anthony's looked at this from an engineering standpoint, but is there a code requirement that you don't put infiltrators closer to, than it, 10 feet? It would be, should be 10 feet from the property line. So how does yeah. that get resolved? Anthony noted, so has that in his memo. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, he wanted us to show a section, but he didn't note that it would be, yeah, we'd have to look into that to... Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm here, by the way. Um, <laughs> I've been listening in. Uh, uh, yeah, typically uh, dry wells are 10 feet off property lines, 10 feet off structures um, because of the tight space in the back that really can't be achieved. If there's no basement, they could justify pushing the infiltrators closer to the structure and get it as far from the property line as possible. So there's ways to deal with that. But that I don't know that that's a zoning code issue. It's more a uh, an engineering guideline. Construction practice. Mm -hmm. okay. So if it's just best practices and, and we keep them 10 feet. you're not concerned from an engineering standpoint, then uh, yeah, we can. Well, what other consideration be could be that they, they could, uh, there is a catch basin in the street, not too far down, uh, closer to the corner, I guess, in DeVoe. But they they could run an overflow pipe out to that catch basis. So that'd be kind of a belt and suspenders kind of thing uh, that might be considered to to you know further that you know uh, cause. So that's something to consider. Is that something you'd sign off on? Yes. Yeah, that okay. sounds like a, an idea. Okay. Anybody else like to speak to this uh, application? Anybody else? Christine online. Can I ask where that tree is that she was speaking about? It's like, uh, maybe see it here. You see it in the aerial. Yeah, in the aerial. So, oh. so if you're looking at DeVoe, it's on well, I could show her the same picture. Right which side. It's this one here? Yeah. And notice that number 43 DeVoe is like on your property. <laughs> number 43 yeah, to vote looks oh, like it's okay. oh, the yeah. tax lot oh, is partly yeah. is, what that <coughs> thing, it, it's you know right. it's a little wacky that's right uh, so we're cutting that down no no it's on the property it's on the property it's hard it's very blurry oh. okay so the trees that we're seeing on the east side of the property those are actually not those are all on the neighbor's property Yes. And you're going to do whatever you can to protect those trees when you do your work? Uh, 92 meters. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I see. Okay. So we have Got a, it. Uh, you know, a setback from the house to that property line. And then there's a stone retaining wall, a couple of feet, and then that's where that tree is right outside that, you know, on that property, on the right side of that retaining wall. And the tree's closer to DeVoe, they're on the neighbor's property also? Right. Yeah, exactly. On the left side? Uh, so like, yeah. No, it's, 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 looking, looking from the right side, side. from the looking right from side. the street. Picture three, um, which is you know, uh, from the park, mm -hmm. almost looking at the property line, you see where those trees are right by the shed three. on the downside of that, you know, stone retaining wall that's there. So and those are not the tree that I was speaking about. I'm speaking about a maple tree that's at the intersection of my property at 84 Maple, um, so farther from Gold Park. Um, but I think it's actually on the retaining wall that's on the DeVoe side. I think that's 43 DeVoe. Yes, 43. Um, but at least, so 43 DeVoe was recently purchased, but the former owners of 43 DeVoe um, we're certain that that tree belonged to the 86 Maple Street property and not to them. Um, so I don't know if, if that it's opinion has changed. Um, but I think this is important to resolve and to consider um, maybe with a conversation between the owner and, and the neighbors directly. I'd be happy to, to speak with the owner, um, but that we should make a plan together if construction's happening around this. Well, you have a wall. survey that should yeah. show this, right? <laughs> well, I don't live at 43 DeVoe. I live at 86 Maple Street, but I share the retaining wall that needs to be replaced. Mm -hmm. And so I have a, an interest in understanding 
who owns the tree so that when we replace the retaining wall, we take care of the tree. The surveyor could easily uh, locate that exactly. She's here. Where it is so that there's no confusion. Yes, it's their tree. No. All right, take it down. There's something on here. Any other comments or questions from the audience? Okay. Or the board? No. No, I'm good. All right. Move to close the public hearing then. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We could. We have a Yes, we do have a draft resolution. Resolution? Yes. Would you like me to read it? Yeah. Um, whereas uh, the project, I mean, excuse me, whereas Michael Lang is seeking site plan and subdivision approval for two lot subdivision and a new two family dwelling, the property is located at 86 Maple Street. Whereas the planning board conducted um, a duly noticed public hearing on April 6, 2023, and it was concluded on April 6, 2023, during which time all those wishing to be heard were given the opportunity to be heard and provide written comments. Whereas this application received the um, received the zoning variances from the Zoning Board of Appeals at its December 14, 2022 meeting. Um, now for their be resolved, um, the planning board of the village of Dobbs Ferry determines that based upon the findings and reasoning set forth below, the application for site plan approval is granted um, with the following conditions. The approved plans that they, they have to meet the approved plans last revised March 21st, 2023, um, and that the applicant actually will pay um, in for the be in lieu of recreation. And then the last um, specific condition is uh, the applicant must address the full satisfaction of the village engineer all outstanding stormwater and stormwater maintenance agreements and engineering issues raised, as well as um, that they have to demonstrate the post planting plan meets the 50% requirement of the total aggregate diameter of trees being removed uh, per the, the village code. Okay. I move that we adopt that. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. And then um, one other, just the, uh, just a very quick uh, ARB resolution approval. Just you know, just acknowledging that this board is uh, giving ARB AHRB approval. Um, based upon the plans that were submitted on March 21st, 2023. Yes. Is that a motion item? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. All right, I move that we adopt, it. We adopt that. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay, next item on our agenda is, I believe, 164 Palisade Street. Good evening, everyone. I'm Pete Gula from Michael Lewis Architects here on Palisade Street in Dobbs Ferry, presenting 164 Palisade Street for Michael Lang and 164 Palisade Street LLC. We've uh, been to the planning board and That's it. gotten approved by them. Last month, we were here for our pre-submission conference for the planning board and AHRB, 
and tonight we're here for our public meeting for Planning Board and AHRB. Since the, uh, since the pre-submission, we've revised the drawings based on the board's comments, as well as the two reviewing engineers' comments. So uh, we could just go and show you the revisions that we've made, or if you'd like, we could go through the project again quickly. I know it's been a long night so far, so. Revisions. revisions. Quick, 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 Maybe quick, the revisions. Quickly is the right word. <laughs> I think with the revisions, it means. <laughs> okay, so uh, the, the main comment on the last time was, uh, was particularly about the two Palisade Street uh, balconies and porches right. that Robert had mentioned. So we took a look at that and uh, made some changes to yeah, make that look a little nicer and <laughs> hopefully uh, address those comments. So before the, uh, the two porches on Palisade were a little uh, balcony-like, they were a little thinner, and the supports were smaller brackets. So what we've done <coughs> there is we've made them deeper in this direction, as well as making the brackets substantially deeper, three feet and almost on the sides, almost the full length of mm -hmm. the, uh, of the, uh, right, I think of, of the balconies. So whereas before, this is the older one from that drawing, you know, this was, they were smaller in this dimension, and they were just smaller brackets. And as you can see here on this, this is the same piece. They're substantially thicker, almost 16 inches deep. Mm -hmm. And then the brackets, well, are, are larger in every direction. Um, so that gives it a, just a more substantial feel to them so they don't feel like they're more of a modern balcony that I think you were commenting on before, Robert. Right. And, uh, and that's the main changes that have been made to the, uh, to the design. Other than that, it's pretty much uh, what you saw before. That's the nice, good. Comment. Yeah. The public hearing. Uh, we open the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone here that wish here or online that wishes to uh, speak to this application? That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Silence. I, I have a question. Oh, where do we end up with the parking issue? <laughs> uh, so I have as part of your resolution that um, you are finding that the 1.25 spaces is not necessary and that there is additional off street parking. Did we have any interest in asking for a agreement with the village for spaces in the mostly empty lot across the street? Or we're just going to leave that alone? Uh, yeah, I mean, you'd have to petition the village to do that to the board. That's years in the making. Yeah, it would be a very complex. That's going to work out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Sorry? Right. Yeah, what about PLOP? Are we going to leave that? So, technically, that um, the pileup is not for this particular zoning district. It's not. So that we it's, it's, could possibly waive the deal up yes. any deal up yeah. that would be correct. associated with that. Well, it sounds like you're not even subject to that, so yeah. that's good. Right. So they propose it. Yeah. What's that? They propose to pay the pile up. They could voluntarily, yes. <laughs> not that the, it's not a downtown zone, but if they can't provide the parking. Wait a minute. What, Wait, say that again. <laughs> if, if, if we, if well, if we deny, we presumably you could force them to do something. You mean if we deny the project based on the lack of parking? No, so we can't. Right. We so can't it's whether that. we want a strong no, on that. that. And I don't. Yeah. No, and in this case, you know, we're trying to, you know, as a general rule, we're trying to minimize parking. We've exactly. had this discussion multiple times tonight, yep. and here's an empty parking lot right across the street. Right, right, right. Yeah. I think this is pretty well hanging fruit. <laughs> it really right. does give deference to the planning board to make determinations on parking, which is in section 300-48G. Thank you for asking my parking okay. question, answering my parking okay. question. All right. So do we already close the public hearing? No. Yes, there's nobody else to talk. There's no in public comment. Do we have a motion for this? 
Resolution. Resolution. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Resolution. A motion is uh, closed. Yes, yeah. 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 Second. All in favor? Second. Aye. Thank you. All right. So. All right. Resolution. Uh, whereas Michael Lewis Architects is seeking site plan approval for additions and improvements to two houses. Um, whereas one is one residential building is located on 64 Palisade Street and the second building is located at 87 Cedar Street. Um, whereas um, the applicant, uh, the planning board has conducted a duly notice uh, public hearing on April 6 and it was concluded on April 6, 2023 during which time all those wishing to be heard were given the opportunity to be heard, um, whereas the application received uh, variances from the Zoning Board of Appeals as a January 11th, 2023 meeting. Um, now, therefore, be it resolved, the uh, Planning Board hereby finds that a proper case exists for uh, requiring that a park be suitably located for playground or other purposes uh, for re reservation of parkland for the one additional res residential unit um, further, be it resolved that the project requires 1.25 parking spaces and the planning board finds that in accordance with section 300-48G of the village code, the applicant does not need to provide the additional parking and there's off street parking available in the vicinity of the property. And be it further resolved, the planning board of the village of Dobbs Ferry determines that based upon the findings and reasoning set forth below, the application for site plan approval is granted subject to the following conditions. Um, the conditions relate to the approved plans, and there's listing of all the plans dated February 7th, 2023. Um, and then there are some updated, uh, excuse me, there are some updated plans dated February 28th, 2023. And um, then the last condition um, focuses on following up with the um, that the applicant must meet all uh, conditions of the village engineer and all outstanding stormwater and stormwater maintenance agreements. Okay. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Good luck. Okay, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Okay, the good news is we're halfway through our agenda. <laughs> oh, and then there's also the, um, I'm sorry, I apologize, the, the AHRB. Yes, yeah, so again, those, the, oh. whereas the uh, applicant is seeking AHRB approval <laughs> and the board uh, approves the AHRB <laughs> based upon the last revised drawings of March 20th, 2023. Thank you. Yeah. I move. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay. Okay, the second half of our meeting uh, consists of five applications, pre submission conference for planning board AHRB agenda. So these are new, new, new to us applications. Number one, 480 Broadway pre submission conference for proposed plans to construct a new deck with spiral staircase. Did I hear something? <laughs> okay. Online. <laughs> uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Matthew Cairo. I'm from. Uh, I'm speaking for Arthur Shabon Architects on behalf of the owners at uh, 480 Broadway. I would like to share my screen if we can do that, so that I can give you my presentation. Okay. Let's see here. There we are. Perfect. All right. All right. Uh, I hope you're able to, to see my screen now. Yes. Excellent. Um, I'll keep this uh, very brief. The proposal that we're making uh, is in regard to a two-story deck, the re actually the replacement of a two previous two-story deck, including a new spiral stair uh, at 480 Broadway. Um, it's at the corner of Broadway and Belden. The stair itself is on the south side of the property. The 
there's a um, new brick terrace that's paving over an area that was originally paved, and we're appending a spiral stair on the bottom of the uh, of, of the area, and then replacing a two-story deck that was on the previous building. This is in the course of restorations and renovations to the original structure. The, the building itself dates from 1890, and we've been undertaking a number of progressive renovations and restorations to the property. The um, proposed upper deck level the, is uh, shown here. We've already been to the ZBA. Um, they approved a variance of approximately 1.7 feet across the setback line uh, in order to allow us to install the spiral stair. Uh, that was approved at the uh, February meeting this year. Uh, and these are the elevations. You can see that uh, from the Broadway elevation at the very back of the building, there's the spiral stair, and uh, that would be the second area of the deck. The remainder of the deck is not visible from either street. This is the uh, the rear elevation, the two rear elevations. This is the lot line elevation of parallel to Belden. This is the lot line elevation, uh, the interior elevation parallel to uh, Broadway. This is, uh, forgive me for a moment here, there it is. These are our, our construction details. The deck is going to be made out of timber with uh, appropriate structural connectors, and uh, the stair would be metal. Uh, these are the existing condition photographs of the area. As you can see, the deck that was originally there was demolished in the course of uh, previous renovations, and uh, we're simply looking to replace it with uh, something that's a little bit more commodious to the uh, the existing property. And the reason for the spiral stair was to minimize the, first of all, minimize the visibility of any stairs going up to the area, and also to maximize the use of the lot. The um, it's a family with uh, children, and the lot that is largely taken up by the by the house. So yard area is at an absolute premium. So we were attempting to kill two birds with one stone, make the the deck as hard to see as possible from all of the uh, all of the street vistas, but also maximize the uh, the lot usage for the yard. And this is the uh, existing area there, as you can see where the where the <coughs> deck was removed, and this is our proposed replacement with the spiral stair. A further view. This is again all along the lot line. I hope so. <laughs> it's a beautiful restoration, by the way. Well, thank you. Yeah. We've worked very hard to to make this a, a real asset to the neighborhood in whatever way we were able. Thank you. Can we can we waive this? We we were going to recommend that it would just be looking at the AHRB portion of it. Right. Okay. And I actually have not It's so great now that we're the joint board. I have. An AHRB related thought. Yes. <laughs> so I don't know if bring you want out. to, I'll bring it up now and you can decide whether or not you want to do anything about it. Um, I, I think it's fine, uh, with the overall design. I'm wondering why, why you're not, two things that I think would make it feel a little bit more like it's part of the house. One is, I don't know why it's this, and maybe it's just the rendering, why it's this kind of cedar brown color and why you weren't using the somehow the colors of the house so that it felt like it was actually a little bit more integral to the house. And to that other point, whether or not there couldn't be brick piers at the bottom of the five support legs that were basically at the same elevation as the brick wainscot, the, br the brick base that you have around the building mm -hmm. to make it feel, it just, it, I mean, the design's fine. It just looks like something that was clipped on and for an otherwise very sensitive set of renovations, as Steve said, I feel like it could it could feel like it's more integrated if there was something done about the color and if those piers, the five posts, had brick piers or something that picked up that the wainscot that's around the foundation of the house. Well, that's certainly something I could propose to our to our client and to my principal. Yeah, it's I'm, you're the designer. I'm just saying. I, those would, I think, be improvements. I would support that as well. I agree. Yes. Uh, call for a public hearing. No, we don't call. Actually, do we call for a public hearing for the HRB? No. 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 We're going to waive site plan, and we're going to. Oh, well, we don't need a public hearing. And and I guess, but next month we'll put our AHRB hats on and just 
close out this discussion that That's we just correct. had. Good. Okay. Correct. Right. Well, HRB is continuing. Yes. Yes. Maybe okay. And we're going to waive site plan. plan. We're going to waive site plan, right? Yeah. We need okay. To, we have to vote on it. Vote on that? Yeah. I move that we waive, waive the site plan. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All in favor. Okay. Okay, so you're going to look into uh, integrating it a little better with the house. I will bring that up with the with the clients and with uh, with my principal, definitely. Great. And then once you do that, you submit new plans to the building department for the next meeting. Okay, excellent. And color that you're going to use um, on the pressure treated wood. Okay. Excellent. Um, we'll do. Are there, uh, any other questions or concerns? No. No. So it looks great. All right. Right. Lovely. Yep. No, thank you. Thank you all very much for your time. Yep. Have a good evening. Yep. Good night. Next item, 11 Fairlawn Avenue, pre-submission conference for proposed new single-family home and associated site and landscape improvements. Hello, my name is Greg Sharp. I'm a local architect and I am presenting a new house uh, at 11 Fairlawn, Outchiller uh, family. Um, is there a way to... So this is a new single family house uh, at 11 Fairlawn. It's the last lot along the river and a pre-approved subdivision. Um, um, the, oh, let me go. Uh, this is an existing survey of the property. There are two, uh, there's a conservation easement and a, a drainage easement that are existing uh, from the original subdivision. Uh, the neighborhood is, is a mix of uh, various types of buildings, um, all single family residences. Um, our house is the house off to the right. So uh, we are trying to create a low profile uh, project and um, due to the constraints of the lot, we've had the house situated uh, in this location. Um, due to the curved nature of the street, uh, we have the garage element uh, kind of blocking the curve as you come around to block headlights and also apparently cars seem to uh, apparently run off the road in that location. So. Um, We've located our garage in that location in order to uh, protect against that um, and to create a little bit of a courtyard type of feature in the front of the house as you, as you pull in. Um, okay. The house is low profile. It's set into the slope of the lot. Let me just keep going. Uh, this is the basement of the house. Uh, the house is uh, two floors. It's set into the hill. So uh, you walk in on the main floor. The entranceway is in the middle. And uh, you come into a great room. There's a master bedroom on the, on the main floor, a living room, a kitchen, uh, access and connection to the garage, and also uh, a deck that has a rather nice views. Uh, we're planning on doing green construction and we plan on doing solar panels on the roof as well. Uh, the elevations of the house are um, 
it's a modern design with a flat uh, floating roof and um, and uh, we're planning on utilizing cement panels, glass, and natural wood as our uh, construction elements. Uh, these are just some images that represent um, you know, similar types of structures and architectural uh, features that, that are sort of uh, similar in nature to the project. Uh, we have some windows, some lights, some window details. Uh, this section uh, indicates how the project is set into the hill and what our, um, what our basic construction section is in relation to the lot. It is a steep lot and we've accommodated the uh, steep slope as required. And now we have some renderings of the, of the project. Let me see if I can figure out how to, yes. So, oh, I'm kind of having a hard time here. Um, anyway, this is a rendering showing the front of the house. Um, it's a relatively low profile uh, design with a flat roof and there are some screening glass elements off to the uh, off to the side. You know, let me see if I can do it. Okay. Uh, this is the elevation from the side, kind of showing the profile of the house with the roof line. This is an elevation. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, from the back of the house, showing the glass, showing the roof, showing the various elements and the conditions uh, that we have. Uh, for the design. Uh, this is showing the house uh, from the other side. Um, well, I gotta go to the next page. Let me see, am I, oh, wait a second. Oh, this is it. This just shows a, another view of the front of the house, just coming slightly from the other direction, showing the garage, showing the, the roof line, the entrance, and uh, some, some low profile uh, landscaping. Um, let me see. This is just another view of the house from basically down the hill. Um, so the house is a uh, contemporary design. Um, we're using natural wood, concrete panels, steel supports. Um, we've shared the project with the neighbors. They do seem supportive of the, of the effort. Uh, the principal concern was basically to not block their view. And I believe due to the low profile nature of the house, um, we've done that. Um, we've received the necessary variances from the ZBA, and um, the, the let me just move this. And the project is uh, oh. sorry. And the project is uh, significantly smaller than the adjacent houses, which is another feature that I think was. Um, um, uh, I guess I'm, I don't know. I think I'm tired or something. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Was supported by the neighbors and and by the ZBA. Seemed to be supportive of the effort to actually make the houses not as large as possible. So um, I think we've we've done a, a a job of of you know working with those concerns and designing a house that I think is appropriate for the neighborhood and the lot and, and the benefit to the, uh, to the neighborhood. So um, at this point, I'd love to hear your questions or comments. 
I think two issues came up in, I think they were the engineering report, they seem likely. Uh, one was the easements associated with the property and the other yeah. one was the stability of the bank. Yeah, so the easements are existing uh, and so the easements are, my, my mouse is, seems to be going crazy here, so hang on a second. See him. Yeah, the, the, this is part of the existing subdivision. So the ease, this is a conservation easement that runs along the entire uh, river. So this seems to be something that was set um, that was set up by the um, um, by the original subdivision. And this easement is a drainage easement, which um, was also set up by the subdivision. And so our understanding is that it just creates, it just uh, houses a drainage line for the neighborhood, for the community. So uh, we are, um, you know, not building anything within those easements. Um, we've respected those easements, so we're not, we're not touching those easements. Um, as far as the stability, so we, we have started to work with the structural engineer. Now I need to attempt how do I go back to my zip drive? What do I have to do? Okay, so, okay. Um, no, that's, that's that one. Hang on a second. Let me go to, um, I, um, we have a geotechnical report. This project has been, uh, I think, you know, there's been various, you know, other previous uh, applicants that have, that have worked on this project. So there has been some information and some studies done. So, oh, why don't I put on this, uh, here we go again. Um, okay, sorry. Okay, so we, we do have a uh, substantial um, geotechnical report that was done on the property and so we have uh, studied this solution but I have uh, condensed this <laughs> very long document very complicated document down to some of the highlights and I think that we can uh, just go to the highlights of that so stabilization so uh, to make a long story short we need to have some drill piles we need to have some uh, um, um, helical uh, drill piles put in along the basically the retaining wall uh, area. This is the condensed version of the report, by the way. Many more pages, but I'm just trying to get to the fun. So the level area where the house is sited, you're going to create that. Is there yes. Okay. Yes, we're going to create that with 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 the foundation of the house. So this is basically a diagram that was created for the um, uh, for this type of application. So as you can see, uh, there needs to be a large drill pile sort of placed at that particular location on the project, and we're developing this as part of a structural package, and we're we're putting in a new retaining wall um, along that conservation easement our retaining wall will not be like this retaining wall it'll be more like a uh, l-shaped uh, stepped retaining wall and then i will have some grade beams going back to connect it to the house um, but my concept is to have one row of uh, of uh, piles along that line and then tie the house in so we've we have studied this problem and we have a uh, um, we know what we have to do this. Is, we're not going into this blind. We've we've seen the neighbors and what's going on with their projects, and we'll uh, not repeat that mistake. And uh, the, we have been given direction by uh, these geotechnical reports, and uh, we do have a structural engineer, and we will have substantial uh, work done in order to mitigate that problem. Okay. Thank you. Um, did, did you say that the retaining uh, wall is going over the easement? Over the drainage easement? New concrete wall going on the easement. Yeah, well, there's an existing. So what there is is there's an existing retaining wall along the whole easement. So we're basically just replacing it with a new retaining wall. So we're not, it's just a replacement. Uh, they use, like, I think, I don't know what it is. It's like a ready rock. It's like a CMU block retaining wall. 
and I would put a new concrete retaining wall there. And along the edge of the easement, you're saying? Yes, it runs along the edge of the easement, but we would be replacing it in the same location. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's existing. Um, and uh, let me go back to that, I guess. Hang on a second. Yes, if I may. The, um, the wall seems to cross the drainage easement, so I think that's what would have to be yeah. shown but, to be a, allowed. Yeah. And but you know, that's if you're going to do it deeper, exactly. But you're, whatever was put there before is fine. But if you're putting a wall there now, I think that you know the easement has to allow it. And obviously, if you're doing deeper pile yeah. foundations, you, is there is there a drain line that actually runs down that drainage easement? I believe so. Yes, I believe it's a, it comes from the street. There's there's a, uh, a, a storm drain. Storm drain, and I believe it connects to the roadway. Um, and um up and, and shown on the plan as well yes and uh but there is an existing retaining wall that runs the whole way and actually connects to the neighbor's properties as well and is a continuous retaining wall that goes along the whole site of all the developments along the uh on this on this area on Fairlawn. and our and our purpose of rebuilding it is not for it's it's because it it you know my my opinion is it should be replaced and just done properly in the scope of this project so our our intent is to just you know while we're doing all this work while we're doing all this concrete work it just seems like it's the most efficient way to accomplish this uh task and uh we're just replacing it in kind we're not we're not uh, putting any new retaining wall structure we're just we are putting a new retaining wall structure. We're just replacing what's existing, though. This is going to sound weird, but um, you might want to look at the wind loads on the on your roof, on the upward forces on your roof, because you know, living near the river, you know, during windy times, you know, I regularly get the, my trash cans blown across Broadway, and, and uh, I used to have a metal shed that gets blown across Broadway. So there. Are, there's some substantial winds coming off the river and yeah. looking at the shape of that roof. Yeah. You really want to a real wing, it. a real wing. Down. Yeah. Well, I do, uh, you know, I've, I've built a significant amount of structures on difficult pro properties and, um, I incorporate a good bit of steel into my designs. That's one of my hallmarks. And so I've, um, we are prepared to do that absolutely so we're prepared to have a, a significant steel infrastructure and have everything tied down and we have specified excellent windows um and so that's really the concept is just to is just to make sure that project is as strong as possible so um that is that is our plan yeah thanks good good and we'll meet the stretch code for energy of course should we uh, call for a public hearing? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I move that we have a public hearing in our next meeting. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good. See you next thank time. you so much. Thank you. Looks very nice. Good. Good, good. Next item on our agenda, item number three on 99 Oliphant Avenue, pre-submission conference for proposed additions and renovations to an existing single-family home. Somehow your mic went off. Is the mic off? No. Can you hear me now? No. No, did it turn off? Yeah. Switch maybe. How's that? That's good. Okay. Um, we're here to show you uh, a project that is a extension renovation of an old Dutch colonial house on um, 
on Oliphon Avenue. Um, we're planning to extend the house so that we can build a new half bath on the uh, side of the house. And then on the back of the house, we're planning to extend the kitchen and the dining room. We received three variances. They were very minor variances. Um, we had a 1% increase in the impervious surfaces. And then we also um, got a side yard and rear yard setback. But these are very small additions. So, um, and the house already is non-conforming. You can see how it's pushed way back in one corner. So when we do these ex did the extensions, we needed variances. One addition on the left is 36 square feet. The other one is 65 square feet. So they've just crossed the threshold where they need us to look at this? Isn't it 100 square feet or something like that? Yeah, and it's up 10 feet. That's why it got sent here. OK. So who's willing to waive it to? That's what we'd recommend with this one. Just wave it. Yeah, I agree. That's up to the board, though. Start to move. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Present late. And these are the photographs of the house. We're planning to expand um, right in the back and fill in this corner. I'll show you in a minute. Um, we meet the sky exposure uh, plane, and we put the addition onto the house. Um, it's just a blow up of our site plan. There was a question about drainage, and this is just showing all the leaders. They're all underground, uh, they're all going into underground pipes. We're gonna relocate the one that's near the addition on the side. Um, but um, there's so such a minimal increase in um, roof area. Um, and when we did a drainage calculation, we had like less than one unit necessary. So we thought we would just tie into the existing system. Um, do all the leaders go into the city sewer system? No. They oh. go into the existing, um, there's a storm drainage system for the house. So oh. We know they're here. They're in, uh, in this vicinity. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think we're only adding 36, 36 square feet of impervious surfaces. Um, so it's really a very insignificant change. We're waving. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> like this. Yeah. Wise guy. I hope so. Next slide, please. Uh, it's just more photographs. These are photographs of the neighboring homes. A lot of them are colonials. We think we don't need any of that. We wave. No. Okay. They're saying that we can wave. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um. Would you like me to show you? Are we just going to look at site plan first and then? I don't think we have to. Do you to, um, have a, sh could you go to one of the drawings that shows this house relative to the other houses, how close the other houses are? There's a site plan that shows like a neighborhood plan. I'm just saying if we waive the public hearing, there's this here. if we waive site plan review, there's no public hearing. Yeah. So I just don't know. We have a, a the neighbors a chance. Here's a, that's it. Dan, isn't there a notification really for AHRB though of the like the they notice neighbors? they can they will notice for the AHRB the age when you open the AHRB part of it they can make comments they can okay. comment because that's not a public hearing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's so. Wait. Yeah, we have letters and support from the neighbor on each side of the house. Really? Okay, yep. never mind. We don't have to push the door. That's fine then. I think our site, we have a, an aerial plan. Yeah. Suzanne? Yeah. Really we, the area map shows how close the right. houses are. Right. And you have already spoken to them. So. so do you have a letter from number 79? They, they appear to be the only ones who will be materially influenced by this. Do you know which name? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
1979. Yeah. But this is full of trees and level mm -hmm. changes and. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. That road is. is uh, yeah. Um. So. Maybe we should look at the presentation before we wave it. Yes, please. Sorry. I'll just show you the whole presentation, which includes our uh, colors and materials. <clears throat> and just to show you a uh, blow up, these are important additions. It really helps them make, give them a usable kitchen. It's really small and very congested area. So um, we have a much better layout. Pulled out the half bath. Um, this is just showing, I think we can keep going, Suzanne. The foundation plan, this is our floor plan to show the new kitchen and the extended dining room so they can get a, a it was a very small dining room even though it's a nice size home. The new half bath that we pulled out from a, what was used to be in like almost like a closet type space in the middle of the kitchen. Um, next slide. So the whole layout has really greatly improved with these additions. On the second floor, we're actually um, redoing this piece where that ensuite bath is, and we're going to create a symmetrical gable that I'll show you on the outside, on the exterior. So this is the view of the back of the house that we're extending, and you see how, you see the photograph of the, like, incomplete gable we're going to complete that little gable add this bump out to extend the dining room all the materials will match existing we're going to have uh, cedar shakes match the old house the old siding we're going to have a copper roof over the bump out because there's an existing copper roof at the front door so we wanted to sort of tie in with that and all the windows will be done in a way that is similar style to the old house um, and then down below is just showing the bump out to the right, very subtle, same um, little c copper roof, and then beyond that, the new gable at the extension of the kitchen. And this is just showing really um, the bump out on the left, which is our new half bath, and the view from the back. We centered that bump out on that. Um, uh, curved window on the second floor so we have a nice symmetry there and all the roofing and siding just ties in with the materials and the colors of the existing house and that existing house is a white house so we didn't bring colors because we're going to match that color that, that white color that's there thank you <clears throat> nice so I'm prepared to waive uh, site yeah. plan review on this yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I move we away, that we waive Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Do we have an HRV component? <laughs> yes, there is an HRV. Yeah. yeah, you could take comment on that too if anybody wanted to comment on that. On the HRV part. Because it's not a public hearing. Right, it's a meeting. Well, That's the next one. If there is any, I don't know. Oh, I see. I don't have any comments. Any neighbors matching the existing, raising their age. improving on the existing. And does anybody want to comment on the, this project? No. Okay. So okay. I think Dan, does this so this is a pre-submission conference? So did so they can't make take action on the HRB tonight, or can they? <laughs> well, the HRB they can because HRB okay. doesn't have pre-submission. It's just the regular. Okay meeting okay so if you want i mean i can draw up a resolution but if you want to just pass you know vote on this application tonight and then i'll just yeah. draw up a resolution okay. we'll have it on next we have to have it on again no no we can, just, we can just vote on it tonight okay. and then i'll just draw up a resolution for the record okay sounds great okay. all right right is that is that recorded? Yeah. okay yeah. all right so um I want to uh, vote on AHRB approval um, based upon the uh, architectural plans. Oops, I'm sorry, uh, architectural plans. Uh, Christina, do you have them dated? What's your architectural yes. plans dated? Well, okay. Wait a minute. Sorry. Oh, I have it here. Uh, Sorry. Okay. Yeah, it's the one that we have right 
23. March 16, 2023. Anyone have a vote? Yep. <laughs> I'll make the motion we approve. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Thanks. Good. Thank you. Last item. <laughs> Wait a minute. Now we have two more. Two. No, we're two we're, more. we're up to the swimming pool. Oh, we have a swimming pool. Oh, oh, where's the swimming pool? 29 Osceola oh, gotcha. Avenue. Yeah. We, we proved that. We, we, we Number did. Of year, a couple of years yeah, ago. Yeah, then we did that, the house approval. Yeah. This is just adding a pool to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. They can heckle the golfers while they're swimming. Pre submission conference for proposed what? swimming pool, hot <laughs> tub, spa, okay. and water feature. <laughs> take a quick, this is a quick break. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. We'll get this done before you come back. 300 to the feet of soil, <laughs> so that way it's here. It can really be weird. Do you mean on the site plan now? Great is this on? Hi. Hi, I'm Laurel Gaffney, uh, PE uh, from Matthew Cordon Architects, and I'm here to present 29 Osceola Avenue. Um, we are adding just a small pool, or we'd like to add a small pool, a patio, um, a prefab uh, hot tub spa, and just some stepping stones. The water feature that was mentioned is we're no longer doing that, um, so it's just the small patio area and the pool and associated drainage with it. Um, so, I mean, it's, I don't know, it's a plunge pool and <laughs> there's not a whole lot to it. How large is the pool? Um, it is, I, hold on. Yeah. Yeah, it's not tiny, but it's also not huge. Um, <laughs> So we received comments from the village engineer yesterday, and there was not anything major in them that we can't respond to. So um, we should be able to address all their comments. So um, I don't think I have a whole lot else to tell you guys, unless you have comments for me. <laughs> um, are there any variances or any zoning code issues associated with this project? Nope. Nope. Okay. Anthony, you still there? He, he had some come. Yes, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you. Um, oh. yeah, we, we, we just had a few um, comments regarding the storm order that just need some clarification. Um, really nothing too, too dramatic. I did actually, I had one question for you on those comments. Mm -hmm. There was something about a um, uh, water clarif clarification. Uh, what was the comment? Water quality unit. Yeah, a water quality um, system. Yeah, in other words, um, before before you enter the dry wells, you should have some kind of, you know, something with a deep sump or something like that. Yeah, I do have a catch stuff. basin shown on the plans already. Okay. So if that's if that's sufficient. Yeah, if you just indicate a sump in there, uh, that would be fine. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Sure. This is another one because it's they move three hundred cubic cubic feet of soil requires site plan um do you recommend waiving it yes <laughs> <laughs> in the next five <laughs> um i should know we should know right what do we do we just say you know, make a motion we take a motion yeah motion to waive second all in favor aye, aye. All right. Okay, excellent. Um, is there Was there anything for HRB on this you, project? You. I mean, I think Anthony's review would cover any any of the things, like lighting, for example. So are you doing lighting? In the um, not, lighting? there's already some lighting in the yard, and as far as I'm aware, they're not planning on really adding anything else. Maybe some lights in the pool, but that's it, <laughs> as far as I'm and aware. We'll look at that. Uh, at permitting and also on the inspections. Okay. Okay. Right. That it's compliant with our code. And okay. is there an AHRB component to this? I don't know. The hot tub. The color of the pool. It, it seems like a stretch, but I just want to make sure. <laughs> the patio colors of. The it's <laughs> bluestone, like square bluestone blocks. Right. That's it. Mm -hmm. 
That's about it. We don't have to vote on it, though. Yeah. It still should have an AHRB approval, okay. and people could comment on the AHRB portion. Okay. If so there's wanted. anybody to comment, <laughs> anybody no, still awake? Another. Yes. <laughs> 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 to uh, uh, vote to approve the uh, site plan dated April 15th. This submission, the last one that we're going to yeah. use, is just one page. Oh, no. This is what I mean. This is whatever date the drawings were due. That's fine. I'll 11, just, 18, I'll just 22. Three sixteen twenty three. Yeah. Okay. Based on the site plan dated three sixteen twenty twenty three, board uh, approved the AHRB portion of the application. Okay. Four. We need a Okay. Board, did we? I move that. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank Aye. you. Thank Aye. you. Great. So we're all done. Yeah, we need yep. a Fantastic. Thank you. So they. Yeah. Okay. You just Last submitted item on our plans. agenda. Item number five is uh, Lafergie Avenue pre-submission conference for proposed plans to construct a new two and a half story residence. It's zero Lafergie, wherever that is. Lafergie. Yeah, it's a weird, Dan. Yeah, it's a weird location. It's actually you said it's it's, it's the property that. That, guy that was subdivided, right? Yes, yeah. it was already subdivided yeah. from uh, 85 Myrtle. Yeah. Right. That's one of my first. Uh... Hi, can you hear us? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hi, this is Pratik Anand and Sarah Layden Anand. We're actually the uh, owners of the lot. We're representing uh, our own selves as our architect cannot be here for Passover. Okay. I'm going to start to share my Green, let me know when you're able. Thank you. And we only have one page from you, right? With the four. Well, no, there's this. No, there, there should be um, two sets. One, I think, has 12 pages, and the other has the four. Pictures. Oh, the four renderings, right? Yeah, the four renderings of the home, correct. 87 Lafergie. Yeah. Site plan, topographic section, steep slope, floor plans. I'm trying to see what where to uh, here's the Oh, here it is. I have it. Sorry. All right. Okay. I can't find it. That may get another variance for the side that I'm setting. Because May we begin? Yes, yes. Please, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thank you, first of all, for uh, your patience and taking us so late. Um, so this is a new one family house on a uh, approved subdivided lot, as you had mentioned. Um, we also have received a ZBA variance for the 6.1 uh, feet of side yard setback that was uh, received back in uh, February. <coughs> So um, we, this is going to be a two and a half story home uh, that will be built into the hill uh, at uh, 87 the Fergie. We received the comments um, from the engineer and uh, we believe we'll have those answers responded by the time of the public hearing. There's nothing there that um, we had a question uh, around. So I'm happy to open up questions uh, that you may have for the property. Do you, I'm, I'm looking at the set. Is there a, I mean, we could look at the Google aerial again, but it's usually nice to see a neighborhood plan that shows proposed house in context with the other built structures in the neighborhood and i don't see that in this set yeah. maybe you could ask your architect i mean it seems like a perfectly reasonable scale project and so on but mm -hmm. it's nice to see where how it will fit in yeah we saw those in the other uh presentation. where the other houses are in the adjacent properties 
Thank we'll you. make sure to have that included. Yep, absolutely. I'm sure it's easy. Uh, yeah, I think it's easily done. One other thing was the height, um, how he figured out the height of the building. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you have a question about it, Dan? Like, was there a sky, are there sky exposure plane diagrams in this yet or no? No, there's not. And, um, there's all, they're also missing a number of things with the materials, specification, right. lighting, landscaping, erosion, sediment control, storm water. There's a lot of information that's still right. missing. Which their architect, I'm sure, has. But, yeah. but in terms of the scale issue, the other thing would be to show the, the the adjacent properties, but also the sky exposure plane, which is, I don't know if your architect explained to you, there this, this kind of imaginary envelope okay. that the houses are supposed to stay within. Mm -hmm. And depending on the grades, that imaginary plane kind of changes. Your architect will be able to lay it out for you and but I think that's something that we'd be looking for. It's not a zoning requirement. It's a guideline that the AHRB uses. So here's the I'm not sure that this is right, ready to go to public hearing yet. Um, yeah, it's too much still outstanding. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So how do we get them a list of what they need to uh, uh, bring next We month? gave them a list and the architect could come in and meet with me and I, we'll I could go over it with them on the height, see how he figured some of the heights and the sky plane exposure and all that. Right. And, then that would show address, um, and who's that speaking? The building inspector. Dan Romer, building inspector. All right, thank you. And then if they address the planning memo and the engineering memos, that also includes a lot of the missing information. So your, your variance is for lot width? Yes, that's correct. And how, where, do they, where do they measure that? So they my that? understanding, it it's was... Not lot width, it's setback. Oh, setback, yeah. Yeah, it was setback. a side yard setback. Side yard they came setback. into the 10, yard, the 10 foot side yard setback. Down on the part that approaches Lafergie. Correct. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah, it was this, this part right here where we were 6.1 feet over. Right. And and what's what's this with the uh, neighbors like turnaround and on the north side of your property? One 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 with Lafergi. I don't think that that's accurate. It's I'm just looking at the at the tax. It's the survey doesn't show the tax that. Tax ma uh, municipal tax parcel viewer. Because it would show in the survey. It would have, I guess so. It would have shown that you'd see that incursion. Okay. See that? It's like a visible last. Yeah. And Dan, the driveways are allowed to be. Are there any? Constraints and how close the driveways can get to the property. It's a recommended eight percent. I believe it's. No, I don't mean the grade. I mean how close they can go and plan. On the one family, you can go right to the property. Go right to the property. Yep. Okay. Okay. No, well, looks like a sweet little house, but I guess there's more. I have a question. Who's doing the cooking? <laughs> I will. I love to cook, um, so uh, we're we're trying to build in a chef's kitchen for that. Because if you, because I'm just noticing um, the location of your appliances and the sink, they're really far from each other. From the magic triangle. Uh, look, that's down here somewhere, right? So you Where? have a range on one side, a right. sink across the refrigerator is all the way on the opposite side, and then you have a wall oven. Yeah. So. We, we have um, two little babies, so we were actually optimizing for as much uh, covered space as possible. Mm -hmm. I see. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you. We'll, we'll take this feedback back to our architect and then all the other comments that were provided to us 
uh, earlier, we'll submit that as soon as we, we get the turnaround. Um, the one thing we did want to mention was one of our neighbors right across the street um, during the ZBA variance meeting had concerns around the runoff. Um, and we do want to uh, address that by saying we have engaged uh, an engineer to do the runoff calculation to make sure that there won't be any impact to that neighbor. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much for your time. Have a good night. Okay. That one will just be continued pre-sub. Yeah. I move we adjourn the meeting. Second. No. <laughs> Do you have any questions? No, I was teasing. <laughs> okay. So vote. <laughs> yes. Adjourn. When, when Ron Jerusalem did that stuff. Somebody's got to say.